What's up, everybody? We've got a jam-packed Pop Star Plus for you. On the show today is the woman behind the voice of Bart Simpson. Of course, Nancy Cartwright shared some memories from over 30 years of The Simpsons. And Brian Baumgartner, who played Kevin Malone on The Office, he spoke to us about why fans love The Office so much. And later, Fran Drescher told us why every human should own a pet. And our buddy Leah Remini revealed what she likes to watch. It might surprise some people. All right, that was a good teaser for you. Let's get to today's first item. It's Nancy Cartwright. She might be the most recognizable voice from The Simpsons because she plays Bart Simpson. She's the voice. She's been behind the naughty and rebellious Bart for 30 years in The Simpsons, and she told us what it's been like to be part of such an iconic show. You know, when I was cast as Bart, it was like, it was such a dream come true for me because I think everybody has a little bit of Bart Simpson in him or her, you know, in them. <laughs> it's true. We all have these personalities. We're, we're, a, we're such, a, a, such a conglomeration of so many personalities. I describe Bart Simpson as being a 10-year-old, school-hating, underachiever, and proud of it. That was the description that I read in the original audition when I went. And I was supposed to go in for Lisa, but I decided I wanted to do Bart. And he just seemed more interesting than an eight-year-old middle child. His description was so much more clear. So I went in and Matt Groening was there and I had an idea in mind and I said, blah, 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 blah. He's like, oh my God, that's him, that's Bart. And I was hired, boom, on the spot. <laughs> Eat my shorts. Eat my shorts. I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? I think Bart Simpson has probably got the most catchphrases of anyone. It's, I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? Eat my shorts. Get bent. No way, man. Cowabunga. Whoa, mama. I mean, all these things are like, whoa. <laughs> Score. It's such a hard question to answer about, like, what's my favorite? I don't really, it's kind of like asking who's your favorite kid. There's a good handful of episodes that definitely rank up there. Some of my favorites are the musicals. I love the musicals, like Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, you know, that's a really good one because that's that takeoff on Mary Poppins and Sherry Bobbins is so funny and the singing of it is just crazy. You know, if you want to be our sitter, please be sweet and never bitter. If you wish to be our sitter, please be sweet and never bitter. Help us with math and book reports. Might I add, eat my shorts. Bart! Oh, when Bart gets an F, that's the title of it. It's the first show of the second season. And kind of humbly speaking, I guess, modestly speaking, that one, it got a lot of attention. And it takes Bart, it turns him into, from the first 13 that we did the first season, that episode really shows you a level of Bart Simpson that you had never seen before. And he goes into he just gets really, really sad. And he's super sincere about how he tried to study. And he starts to cry because he feels like he's gonna flunk the fourth grade. And um, that that stands out in my mind. What's the matter? <laughs> well, I would think you'd be used to failing by now. <laughs> No, you don't understand. I really tried this time. I mean, I really tried. Early on in the show, um, it was made very clear to us that, that the actors are not the stars of the show, that the characters are the stars of the show, and I, nobody had any problem with that. I don't think anybody had any idea that the show was going to go on, you know, 33 plus years and, and turn into the icon that it is. But we instead, we're all like armpit to armpit, elbow to elbow in one little tiny booth that was not meant for recording in. So we had like moving carpets up on the walls because they were, one big wall was all glass and when we spoke it would vibrate so they had to put a carpet in front of it and we would all share the same microphone, armpit check, you know. Uh, um, and here I am very pregnant. It was a lot of um, give and take. Uh, from, from all of us actors, but it was, I, I look at that and like, that is such a 
such a humble, modest beginning for what came to be, you know, it's pretty cool. When I meet fans, it's like, it's, it's pretty cool because most of the time I'm not recognized. Most of the time I'm just this anonymous celebrity and it doesn't matter where I am, nobody, because I don't look like him, my skin's not yellow, nine spikes, I'm not a 10 year old boy. But I can have more causation over revealing who I really am. And so if it's just a spontaneous thing and I'm talking to somebody and I ask them, so what's your name? And they say, oh, my name's Katie. And I'll say, oh, hi, Katie, I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? And it is just like the jaw drops to the ground. And it's equally fun for me. It still is to this day. I love surprising people. And it's kind of a cool thing. It sometimes pops people out of their funk. And isn't that kind of what we need right now? We need some kind of enlightenment. We need some humor, some lightness, some aesthetics. One question that people like to ask me is, why is The Simpsons so successful? How has it lasted this, this long? And I think it just, it, it actually doesn't even matter what, this is funny to say this, what decade you look at, because we're, <laughs> we're in our third decade. That's crazy. But no matter what decade you look at, The Simpsons, has a consistency in the the business model, in you know the way that it's done. It's got this family that has its own kind of rules or or lack of uh, lack of rules, and they're kind of a nice quote unquote normal family. And I do think they represent a lot of people that can say, "Wow, that's us." You know, whether it's the Simpsons or all the citizens of Springfield, it's like people can find things that they can relate to. And that has been such a success and the tip of the hat to the writers and the executives on the show. Thanks to Nancy for sharing all those memories with us. Next up, we're revisiting the Dunder Mifflin Paper Company with the Office star, Brian Baumgartner. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? There's a Supreme Court nominee. What would it take for you to vote to confirm her? So I guess the question is, can this end with sanctions alone? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. We have Scranton, Pennsylvania on the mind for this next flashback interview. Hard to believe it's been 17 years since the premiere of The Office, the hit TV show about the work lives of paper company employees. Brian Baumgartner played the lovable Kevin Malone and weighed in on why he thinks people still love the show so much. At least once a year, I like to bring in some of my Kevin's famous chili. At least once a year, I like to bring in some of my Kevin's famous chili. I want to eat pigs in a blanket in a blanket. Nope, it's not Ashton Kutcher. It's Kevin Malone. Equally handsome, equally smart. Well, Kevin Malone, <laughs> how would I describe Kevin Malone? Uh, I think Kevin Malone is a, a man of uh, some unique skills um, who uh, is, is misunderstood in a way. His childlike sensibility fits into the rest of the ensemble of The Office 
um, very well. I had such a blast playing him and, and continue to be delighted by, by how fans re react to him. I do think that of all of the other actors and, and, and characters uh, on The Office, I do think that, that probably I'm the most dissimilar uh, to mine. My Kleenex shoes were a huge conversation piece, but man, my dogs are barking. But, you know, look, I loved, I, I loved his ability um, to be in the moment. I used to say he has no memory of what happened before or any ramifications for what might happen uh, in the future. But in the moment, he uh, if he enjoyed a moment, he was willing to show it. Um, often didn't think too far ahead, but I had uh, I had a blast playing with him. And, and you know, our little... Uh, our little group in the corner, the accountants, Oscar and Angela and Kevin, I, I describe it as, as kind of a perfect comedy triangle. Well, I need to give my cat up for adoption. Mm. The one who uses the doorbell or the one with the Mexican hat or the one with the rain galoshes or the one that you let go around naked. Which had nothing to do with us, which had to do with the, the writers and the construction of the characters. But um, the way that the alliances kept shifting, their specific personalities and how they played off of each other uh, was so much fun to do for, for almost a decade. I think for me now, my favorite episode would have to be Stress Relief. Um, otherwise known as uh, the Dwight's fake fire drill. Oh, here's a door. Check that one out. How's the handle? And it's warm. Okay, go to the back well, door. Well, uh, another option. Another option. Jeez. Okay, settle down, everyone. And I think, you know, for me now, um, there's so many great episodes but I, I think for me what was happening outside of the show uh carries special significance for me as well so i think it's a hilariously funny well-written episode i saw a friend today it had been a while we forgot each other's name a lot of things spring to mind thinking about the finale I basically shot the show my 30s. My whole 30s was dedicated to being together, which is, is high school and college, and then two more years, uh, spending a lot of time with those people. So, you know, it was really knowing that whatever happened, the, the friendships would be there, um, the relationships would, would remain, but we wouldn't be spending 60 to 70 hours a week together anymore. And that, that was gonna be a, a huge change. Uh, for us, so uh, a huge feeling of loss, uh, but also tremendously proud of the journey that we had and the fact that we chose to end it. We had a story that we wanted to tell and we made sure that, that we got that story in uh, and told it you know, largely with, with the original people who were, were cast. I mean, I don't, I don't think anyone who was on the show could have ever guessed that the show would end up doing um, becoming what it has become today. I mean, we were we were almost, we almost made a pilot and was never on the air. And then, you know, the fact that, that an audience picked up on it. I always knew what we were doing was special. If people gave it a chance, I just thought, well, people aren't gonna give it a chance. So um, I'm, I'm tremendously uh, proud of the show. As I say to people, I'm, I'm a fan of the show. And, 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 and love watching it and, and I'm so proud to have been a part of it. You know, in, in examining through this book that I have coming out, Welcome to Dunder Mifflin, you know, one of the things that we are looking at is why the show has not just survived, but has thrived eight years after we have filmed any anything. And I think that it's really about the people uh, it's really about the construction of, of of the idea and the aesthetic of the show that was so really revolutionary and groundbreaking at the time, but the hiring of the specific actors to play the roles and the writing staff that was brought in, which are now the top comedy writers in television today. You know, it was just a, a special and unique collection of people uh, led by Greg Daniels, who, you know, created the show um, and uh, and his genius in, in, in finding the perfect people for their job. That's really why I think. What a classic. We love that show in our house. Hope you enjoyed that one. Office fans, it was for you. Coming up, 
We've got nanny star Fran Drescher sharing the key to easing her anxiety. It happens to be her furry friend. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? There's a Supreme Court nominee. What would it take for you to vote to confirm her? So I guess the question is, can this end with sanctions alone? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it, I know that it can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. Did you know that Fran Drescher is a huge, huge dog lover? She's even had a famous dog of her own. Get this, Chester, that's the dog on the nanny, was actually Fran's real life dog. She told us all about that and how her pets have shaped her life in this episode of our series, My Pet Tale. I start on the nanny and I wrote a part for my first dog ever, Chester Drescher. Oh, Chester, I haven't seen you in such a long time. Nanny Fine, please, he doesn't like strangers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Chester was an amazing dog because he was extremely consistent in his behavior. We knew what he would do under certain circumstances. So we wrote towards that. And that was why every time, you know, Cece Babcock grabbed him away from me, we knew that he would growl. Oh, how thoughtful. <laughs> so we always had her do that. You need some time to get used to you. I mean, you can't expect a dog to just jump into your arms and love you at first sight. That's Sheffield. Oh, you got a rope puppy. Oh, how sweet. Oh, look how friendly. And it was great working with him because he was always on the set anyway. I'm always of the camp, must love dogs. I have a, a dog now, uh, Angel Grace, and I rescued her just days before lockdown. And then she rescued me. And for the first couple of months of our relationship at my house, you know, it was just her and me. I don't think she really uh, knew what was happening. <laughs> But all of a sudden, you know, it was just the two of us for a couple of months. And so it really did bond us. And we're very, very close now. And she's three years old and I travel with her and she's my service animal. So I'm just very grateful to have the first big dog I've ever had. And, you know, she uh, gives me added security and, uh, and helps me through situations that sometimes would otherwise um, make me anxious. She's kind of different shades of white and bone. And I thought she was so loving when I met her at the rescue place and so sweet uh, that uh, I said, you know, are you an angel? Did Samson send you to me? And Samson was the dog that sadly 
uh, had died just days earlier uh, from a stroke. I said, are you an angel? Is that your name? And it just seemed suitable to her because she is such an angel. She is definitely a big part of the family. She's got all these other mothers who come and take care of her if I have to go out of town and I can't take her with me. Dog is God spelled backwards, and I think that dogs are here to teach us unconditional love, to remind us that there's room in our hearts to love another, even if you've loved and lost. And I think that every human should experience unconditional love. It's just a, a bond between two species that really is unparalleled. I just, you know, couldn't live without having a canine to love and care for and feel loved by and share my bed with. Just be there as a friend and a companion and company, a wonderful company. In fact, as a cancer survivor, you know, I always tell other people recently diagnosed, make sure your pet sleeps in the bed with you because at night is when your imagination and fear starts to run wild because you don't have the distractions of the day. And if you don't have a pet, get one. Well, it's really nice to hear people's pet stories. They mean so much. All right, still to come, Leah Remini breaks down her must-watch list. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Well, meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. And welcome back. We absolutely love learning more about our friend Leah Remini. When she can't fall asleep, she turns to one particular show, and it just might surprise you. She spoke to us for our What I Watch series. When I have to fall asleep, when I can't fall asleep, I put on forensic files. Don't know why, listening to stories, people being murdered, gets me to sleep. That's probably, I mean, a psychologist would probably have an answer. It was a delivery he never expected. The older version of forensic files, the guy's voice, it's so soothing. And he's like, and then, he found her decapitated. Something about the guy's voice. I don't know what it is. What I watch when I need comfort food is a reality show. Pick anyone, housewives of any state. Or I watch a Love Island, or I watch Below Deck. Basically, Bravo. What I love about reality shows in general is that I just feel like it takes me away, like it's a mind vacation. I, I, I find myself not multitasking in my brain, like when I'm watching something um, that's you know newsworthy, I start to think about all the things I need to do in my life, things I'm not doing right. Um, I think I should be a better daughter, a better mother, a better this, a better aunt, a better sister, you know. 
But when I watch reality shows, it's almost like my mind is suspended. It is literally frozen. And I mean, I the picture of, I get of myself while I'm watching reality shows is just kind of drool. Kind of, but it isn't, but I, like, that's what I picture myself doing because it's so mind numbing. My daughter Sophia got me onto Love Island, but only UK versions. Like, she, you know, we find that to be li- the better versions of, of, of Love Island. <laughs> it's a little riskier. Um, so I, I really tend to, to go to those or like I'll watch a marathon of like Say Yes to the Dress. It's the not having to think about changing the channel or, you know, so it's usually if I see there's five, six, seven, eight seasons of something, I'm in because then somehow I like fall asleep and then I'm like, wait, well, how'd I get on season four? And it's just anything that has multiple seasons. What I watch that might surprise people, I don't know that what I watch might surprise people. I do watch a lot of documentaries. I don't know that that's surprising to people, but when people talk about documentaries, they're like, you probably haven't seen this. I'm like, seen it. Like, I'll watch a documentary on uh, flies. Like, I just love documentaries. It doesn't really matter what it is. I just love uh, real stories. Sitting here in traffic on the Queensboro Bridge tonight. I didn't need to prepare for the King of Queens because I am Carrie. Um, there's no need for me to prep. Oh, she's a girl from Brooklyn married to a neighborhood guy who has a crazy father in her basement. Like there was nothing I needed to prep for. I knew the character. I know the character very well. But you know what's funny about the King of Queens is that I remember um, our producers, when I first got the role, we did a pilot and our executive producer was like, you know, why do you, why are you wearing makeup? And I was like, first of all, have you been to a borough in New York? Like, you know what I mean? Like Queens, Brooklyn, what do, like the idea of what a borough, per, like, was like, they don't get their nails done. They don't wear makeup. And I was like, first of all, everything from a borough, like I'm from Bensonhurst. Don't tell me, like, I didn't have a lot of money growing up, but my stuff was coordinated. You know, like my outfits were matching the shirt, you know, back in my day, it was matching your shirt with your socks and like everything was color coordinated. So like the idea of what somebody from New York is like was so off that I was like, no, no, I, this girl gets her nails done. This girl gets her hair done. This girl, like, cause this girl is me. So we're not doing sweatpants and, and I go, and by the way, if we wear sweatpants, it's color coordinated. What, what I watched when I did a good cry, oh my God. terms of endearment, um, the notebook. Steel Magnolias. It's about friendships. It's about family. It's about um, losing people that you love. I mean, it's just, and the notebook just like, just kills me. It just, every time. There's not a time. And then um, Moulin Rouge. I know that sounds crazy, but I cry every time. Every time she dies. Every time. I've seen it. 56 times, probably just in the last year. It's a wonderful life. Every holiday, crying. Every time, every time. What I watch with my family is anything my daughter wants to watch. It's not um, done by votes or even what her parents would want to watch because as they get older, They have their own rooms, they have their own computers, they can watch whatever they want to watch. So if my daughter says, I want to watch such and such with you guys, I'm like, K, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Whatever she wants to watch, I'm like, I will watch. Thanks to Leah for hanging out with us. We appreciate it. Well, there you have it. That was today's Popstar Plus. Thanks for being here and join us again tomorrow. We'll see you then. Bye.
you ask most people, they'd say reaching the NFL would be a career pinnacle, the top of the mountain. But for my guest today, the NFL was just the beginning. As a linebacker who played on three pro teams, retiring in 2015, Emmanuel Acho was just getting started. Turns out Emmanuel's calling was off the field in missionary work, and more recently, social justice. Just under two years ago, Emmanuel decided to create and host an online video series of conversations about racism called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. It's since been viewed more than 80 million times and went on to win an Emmy in 2021. And now Emmanuel is setting out to help others find meaning in their lives. Emmanuel, what a pleasure it is to have you on Making Space. I feel like you are our perfect guest because you are somebody who follows uh, a part of you that isn't always your intellect. It isn't always your pro-con list. You go with something that is beyond that. Since you were a kid, let's go back, let's go back. Since you were a kid and you were making decisions on where to go, what to do, what led you? I've never been asked that question before. I am led by my convictions. And so when, when I say conviction, what do, we, what do you mean? I'm led by some innate inner yearning to move, to act, to go. Um, that's truly what led me. It's my convictions. And so if I ever feel convicted to move in a certain way, a certain direction, that is the manner in which I go. Sometimes it makes no practical sense at all. Um, but I just feel like you have to move by convictions. I mean, look, when you're a kid, you don't know what the risks are. There are no risks. You jump off the swing, you jump off, you'll realize later that that hurt. But you're free because you don't know the risks. It's like someone who's never had their heart broken. They fall in love harder. How did you manage to keep that even though you've been through disappointments, things that hadn't worked in your life. What was it, um, Michael Jordan, uh, who said like, I missed so many thousands of shots, um, but nobody ne necessarily remembers the misses. It's Babe Ruth, who I believe said, your next strikeout only brings you closer to your next home run. I don't try to focus on my failures. The only true failure is in not getting up. The only true failure is in not trying. Hold on, I was thinking about it the other day um, after I failed at something recently and I was like, I didn't fail, I fell. And as long oh. as I get up, I win. I love that. You're the, you're the child of immigrants, by the way. Um, I have to let you know that when I was in third grade, I went to school in Ibadan, Nigeria for a year. My dad was a professor there. Yeah, we really? went to school. Yes, we have <laughs> such fond memories. It was just a year as the child of immigrants. I, and I'm a child of, of immigrants too. I feel like there's something different that's in us. What did your parents give to you that led you to the man who you are today? Well, when you travel the world and you see other parts of the world, your mind and the aperture of your understanding is just so opened. What did my parents give me? A certain resiliency. I just learned a different type of resilience. I learned a different type of understanding of how blessed we are in America. You don't really understand the American dream until you realize the nightmare is somewhere else. And I've just lived other countries' nightmares. And so I, I, I understand a difference in a dream. And you've lived the American dream too, boy. <laughs> Did you feel like this feels like my mountaintop? You know, I didn't. The NFL was truly amazing. It was amazing. But unless you are in the top five percentile, the NFL, it too is scary. The reason I didn't feel like it was my mountaintop, I knew the NFL was a means to an end. Hold on, I like answering questions in story form. I vividly remember fearing I was going to be released every day I was in the NFL. The NFL, you have 53 people on a roster. Essentially, you have 53 employees. I was probably the 47th to the 53rd person on the roster as far as importance. Every Tuesday of an NFL week is when you get paid. So if you are on the roster on Tuesday, you know you are going to receive a check that week. So that means by Monday night, you likely will be released if you are going to be released. I was cut in the NFL five times before the age of 25. Imagine being hired 
at a job out of college, then being transferred across the country from that job, then being fired by your employer who transferred you and then being rehired and fired and rehired and fired and rehired and fired five times all by the age of 25. So the NFL to me was, it was so taxing. It was so anxiety uh, heavy. The NFL was not a highlight of my life. Oh, wow. Why did you stay in it as long as you did? In the NFL, if you play for four years, you're vested pension and you have annuity. And so the NFL was practical. I was like, okay, play four years. You have all the benefits. As soon as I hit four years, I was like, it is time to get out of here. So it was an easy decision. Simple. Not at all. Not easy. Why? Because the NFL, it cripples every one of your abilities besides playing sports. That's what nobody tells you. Imagine you graduate with a degree, which, by the way, is already hard if you're trying to make it to the NFL because playing college sports is a full time job. But imagine graduating with a degree, then whatever degree you graduate with, you have to put on ice for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine or 10 years. So all of that knowledge which you have acquired is now gone to waste because you have been sitting here trying to play in the NFL. So transitioning is near impossible because it's all you've ever known. Every August, think about this, for 20 consecutive years, really 17, from when I was eight years old until I was 25 years old, every August I was wearing a football helmet. Then you wake up one August day and you're not putting a helmet on. It's, it's depressing, it's saddening. You go into dark places. You talked about how you stayed in the NFL for four years so you could get vested, you could get this. You, to me, if I'm listening to you and not knowing anything about you, seem like a very logical guy. I love that your book is called Illogical because it really, there is something beyond a pro con list in life. What kept you kind of jumping in the deep end, even if you knew the odds were against you? Our greatest accomplishments in life, our greatest accomplishments in life come on the other side of our logic. So what is keeping me from my destiny? And that's really the way in which I operate. The, the scariest phrase that can ever be uttered is that's the way we've always done things, or that's the way I've always done things. And I just understand that our greatest accomplishments, my greatest accomplishment, your greatest accomplishment, I guarantee it'll come on the other side of my logic. So how can I be more illogical? Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Well, I love that, you, which you just dovetailed nicely into your uncomfortable conversations with a black man. I mean, this is something that you felt a burning desire to do. People told you it was not a good idea. They said no. People close to yes, me. Yes, you're... But this was... This is, yes, imagine you're an athlete and you ask your coach what you should do and your coach says don't do something. Imagine you are a child and you ask your parent what you should do and your parent says don't do something. But I had a calling and what I realized, Hoda, is my calling wasn't a conference call. Hmm. Uh, my calling was my calling. 
and only I got that calling. Nobody else heard what I heard. And it wasn't audible. It was within my own soul, my own spirit, if you will. How did you know that this was not something to ignore? I knew it was not something to ignore because I didn't have the luxury of ignoring it. What lives were going to be lost because of my lack of speech? And I think we all eventually have to ask ourselves that question. And it might not be a literal loss of life like a death, but what dream won't be fulfilled because I'm too afraid to act, because I'm so bound by logic? It might be my own dream. It might be a community that I might change. It might be a family that I might impact. It might be a neighborhood. It might be a city. It might be a religious gathering. But like, who am I costing because of my lack of courage? So many people ask me, Hoda, Emmanuel, how do you find your calling? Mm -hmm. And after pausing and thinking, I said, your calling will call you, just pick mm -hmm. up. So many people are searching left and right. I don't know what my calling is in life. I don't know what my purpose is in life. I don't know what I'm meant to do. Yo, your calling will call you and it probably already has. You're just not picking up. My calling literally called me. Matthew McConaughey, he called me from a no caller ID number after my first episode of Uncomfortable Conversations got 25 million views. I picked up, Acho, McConaughey speaking. I want to have a conversation. I was like, what, Ma Ma Matthew McConaughey? <laughs> um, he's like, yeah, I want to have a conversation. I was like, okay, well, we'll record episode two in four days. True story. I did not want to do another episode of Uncomfortable Conversations because of how big the first one was. McConaughey says, let's record it tomorrow. After McConaughey calls me, I get another call from a no caller ID number. Uh, caller ID number. Hi, Emmanuel. Oprah Winfrey speaking. Uh, Oprah? Like, <laughs> Oprah, Oprah? <laughs> Emmanuel, what is your intention? She asked me. Which, yeah, um, what did you say? That's good. I, I said, Oprah, my intention is to change the world, and I truly believe I can. All of that to say to those listening, your calling will call you. You just have to make that a logical decision to pick up. My calling was a literal no caller ID calls, but other people's calling will just be that internal yearning and that internal desire to do something that just seems a little crazy. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it, I know that it can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You know, they say that when you find your calling, you, it's like you're riding a wave. Your whole life you swim upstream and all of a sudden you find the thing that you're supposed to be doing and suddenly you feel like all of the forces of the universe are taking you in the way you're supposed to be going. You're on this ride. Do you feel like that's what's happening or are you swimming up? 
Man, what's interesting, when you say riding a wave, I think there's inher- an inherent sense of ease that seems like yeah. it comes with that. I do believe your calling is what you're made for and your career is what you're paid for. Uncomfortable conversations is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Uh, so I can't say that I'm riding a wave yeah. because it's just so incredibly difficult. But your calling is just what you're made to do. Mm. Um, but sometimes it is a detour. And uncomfortable conversations was a detour. It was not my destination. A logical was my destination. Mm-hmm. Um, living a life and encouraging people to live their best life. That was my destination. I got my master's degree in sports psychology. So talking about, hey, let's all achieve the dreams we so desperately desire. That was my destination. Hoda, I just had to take a quick detour um, for the, for the <laughs> and- betterment of those around me. I was reading a book and they were talking about how that in this big field, there was one wildflower growing and that everything on God's earth knows exactly what it is supposed to do without being told or thought out. That wildflower wasn't meant to be famous or popular or make lots of money. That wildflower is meant to bloom in the middle of that field, face the sun and make us all feel good. That was its purpose. And they said how people were the only thing in God's earth who don't really have to, have to sort of figure it out or spend our lives trying to be more like this one. I'm gonna yeah. be like Oprah, I wanna be like Denzel. Yeah. I wanna take a page from that. How is it that you were able to find, cause it sounds like you have your voice. How did you find it and how do you think people can find it? Cause everyone wants to look like that one, dress like that one, be like that one. It's in realizing that you have to be yourself because everybody else is already taken. Mm. And what I've realized is just, I have to be the best version of me. And the what you said is so wonderful about the wildflower. I think the problem we all collectively have as humans is we all have this innate desire to want to be like somebody else instead of simply being the best version of ourselves. Mm. And that is when I talk about like, it's just conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom says we should all do X, we should all do Y, we should all do Z, we should all go to high school, then we should all go to college, then we should all get a job, then we should all get married, then we should all have kids, and we should all live in a house behind a white picket fence. And the problem is, conventional wisdom is limiting all of us, in my greatest opinion. Conventional wisdom is limiting us from the life that we all deserve to be living. And I just finally said, wait a second, why am I going to live inside of someone else's box? Why am I going to let insignificant people have such significance in my life? Clearly faith is front and center with you. It comes out in almost every single answer that you are giving me. Sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's subtle, but it's always there. Um, how has your faith played in, uh, in this journey of yours? My faith has driven me in this journey. And what I believe is we all have faith. The question is, when you sit down in a chair, you have faith that that chair is going to hold you up. Mm -hmm. So we are all, to some degree, people of faith. My faith drives me because, one, I understand what I've put on this earth to do, and it's just to touch lives, it's to to share the good news, it's to to talk about Jesus when I can. Um, But more than that, or not more than that, but in alongside with that, faith can be illogical. (laughs) Like... (laughs) Like, that's what people don't understand. Like, whether it is, think about this for a second. Noah was commissioned by God to build a boat and put every animal on it because there was going to be a flood. Hoda, can you imagine how many people saw Noah building every day saying, bro, what the heck are you doing? (laughs) Like, you are a fool until he looks out of the window and he puts his head up into the sky and then he get he feels it between his brows smack dab it's the first drop of rain mm. and the first drop of rain tells him that the flood is coming and i have a chapter actually titled the first drop of rain because when you've been illogical when i've been illogical that first drop of rain is going to hit. And when that first drop of rain hits you, that is when you know the flood is coming. So what was my first drop of rain? That call from Matthew McConaughey. Mm. The call from Matthew McConaughey, I hadn't yet written a book. I hadn't yet heard from Oprah. I hadn't yet been a bestseller. I hadn't yet won an Emmy. I hadn't yet done anything besides a video. But when McConaughey called, that was my first drop of rain, and that was the signal that the flood is coming. So when you make that a logical decision, whether it's building a boat, whether it's uh, sitting in front of a camera, whether it's starting a business, as soon as you get that first drop of rain, 
you know the flood is coming. And my faith literally moves me in life because it, it is mm. testaments like that. Wow, that is absolutely beautiful. And I know you, your book, Illogical, you say that's your calling. Like, that's what you're meant to do. You're meant to help. You're meant to heal. You're meant to encourage and cheerlead. I mean, that's so in your DNA. But there are a bunch of people, many people, and we've all been there ourselves, too, if we're not there right now, it's you're lost. Like, things aren't working for me, you know, and they're trying to figure out how to get up, how to pull up. Um, I know you've, you've got your faith and you've also got your sports psychology degree. You've got a lot going for you. But how, how do you speak to someone like that? Well, the first thing I would do is just encourage them that it's okay to not be okay. Mm -hmm. Like, it's okay to be down for a little bit. The reason a mountain has peaks is because it has valleys. Mm -hmm. If there were no valleys, then everything would just seem like flat and level ground. Mm -hmm. So the valley is actually what dictates the peak. Um, I would also say that your time is coming, but you too have to make your time come. They say luck is when preparation meets opportunity. You can't win the lotto unless you buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. So you can sit there and hope and pray all you want to win the lotto, but you can't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. So are mm -hmm. you buying tickets? I could hope and pray all I want and wish to change the world, but it was sitting down in front of the camera that led to uncomfortable conversations. It took action. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now, everyone who I've ever interviewed um, loves the high moments in life, but that's not obviously where they learn anything. They learn things on their, on their deepest valleys. What was your deepest valley? My deepest valley? Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, remember I was in Philadelphia. I was drafted to the Cleveland Browns in 2012. In 2013, the Philadelphia Eagles, they traded for me. I was now in Philadelphia, but remember I told y'all I was cut five times by that organization. One of the final times I got cut and what people don't realize about the National Football League, when you get cut, they instantly remove your access from the building. You can no longer go into the building for anything from a Gatorade shake to a workout to anything. I lived in Philadelphia. I lived very close to the Rocky Steps, but I still wanted to continue playing. So true story. After I got cut, I believe it was the second to last time, I would have to go to an abandoned field to work out. I showed up one day and the field is covered in nothing but pigeons. I didn't have bags. In, in football, you need a bags about five feet long and one foot high to just do different drills over. You might need to hop over the bag. You might need to sprint in front of a bag, then backpedal behind another one. Just do different uh, drills. I didn't have bags, so I had to steal street cones, construction orange street cones. So now imagine, I used to be this NFL player on Monday, 
But on Tuesday, I'm in an abandoned field, shooing pigeons off of the field, stealing construction cones, laying these construction cones on this field that has, was once overrun by pigeons, and I'm working out by myself, knowing that 20 minutes across town, all of my teammates and my best friends are there. Those were the lowest moments of my life. Man, I kept it up until I got another call and the Eagles called me back and they signed me again. But then I broke my thumb. Uh, and after I broke my thumb, I'm having surgery. And I knew, I knew one of two things. If they had to put pins in my thumb, the Eagles were going to release me. Because if they put pins in my thumb, I could not play because pins protrude from the skin. So you can't put a bandage on it and play with it. If they put screws in my thumb, I could still play because with screws, you could put a club on your hand and still play. So immediately after my surgery operation, I wake up and I look at the doctor and all I ask him is, pins or screws because if I if he says pins the Eagles were going to release me for the final time if he says screws then I am still going to be employed I wake up still partially sedated and I just say pins or screws and he says pins um, I start weeping I go to the Eagles facility the general manager meets me at the front door and he says hey Emmanuel coach wants to see you bring your playbook that means you're getting released with my left hand, I now have to pack up my locker for the final time. I have a huge trash bag with tears down my eyes and my hand casted. And for the final time, I left the Philadelphia Eagles facility. It, funny enough, and interestingly enough, for those interested in that story, I lead the book, Illogical. The chapter starts yeah. with pins and screws. Um, pins and so the and very screws. first, the very I first like, chapter is pins and screws. I feel like God was busy trying to tell you all along that it was time to say goodbye to football, but you go. just wouldn't li You weren't listening. Remember you said you got to listen? You were like this. Not yet. I need pins or screws. I need oh, to get down to the end. My, I need my was, five times. It was terrible. I but, was like but truly, does, truly terrible. But that does, Emmanuel, bring you to that thing, which, again, I keep going back to, which is how do you know if God's trying to tell you to work harder which is what you were doing all those five times with the, or how do you know if he's trying to tell you pivot time yeah. to pivot now? How do you know when it's time? I think when you have exhausted your emotional, your financial uh, and your spiritual bandwidth, and it's like, you know what, unless this works and if this is not blessed, I am going to move on. You know, just back to your book for a minute, illogical. Um, what do you hope that people, I know there's a lot of great life lessons in there, and I don't even know where to begin with them, quite frankly, because every time I turned a page, I was like, highlighter, highlighter. But there, it's got really good original ideas. But give me a couple that you think that people would like to take away. Along your illogical journey, so many people are going to tell you what you can't do instead of what you can do. Mm -hmm. And you are going to need to block out that noise. So do not ever forget your earmuffs so on your destiny towards being the best version of yourself and living the life of your dreams you're going to have a might be crazy moment we already discussed that first drop of rain moment when you are being illogical there's going to come a point in time when you have and you experience that first drop of rain which tells you your your your, your success is coming true story in sixth grade, I was at my friend's house and we were eating burgers. His older brother walked in and he threw something at the table. My dear friend ran from the table and started hiding behind a chair. I was like, what in God's name is going on? I looked at what his older brother threw at the table and it was simply a pack ketchup packet. I cracked it open after checking up my friend and I started eating my fries with some ketchup. At that point in time, I learned a valuable lesson that day, Hoda. Don't be afraid of other people's fears. Ooh, don't be that's afraid good. Of other fears. And so many of us in life are afraid of other people's fears. Well, well, I'm not going to start a business because my friend was afraid to. Yeah, I'm not going to get in a relationship because my homegirl got cheated on. I'm not going to get married because my, 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 my dad and my mom have never had. I've never seen a successful relationship. I can't leave this city. Nobody in my family has never ever left Austin, Texas. Why would I leave? I refuse to fly in an airplane because so and so is afraid of flying on an air. We're so afraid of other people's fears, not even our own. It's the craziest thing. That We're not even afraid brilliant. of our own fears. The book is called Illogical. It's by Emmanuel Acho. He's got great conversations. You can find him everywhere. You're making your mark. Look <laughs> at you. You're blazing your trail. Get out of your way. Thank you, my friend. <laughs>
Emmanuel, thank you. It was, a, it was wonderful talking to you. I enjoyed every second. Likewise. Welcome to Today All Day. All Day? Today All Day. All Day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking, yeah. who's your okay. favorite character you've ever oh, played? The right. unicorn. The unicorn. you got to have the unicorn. <laughs> what, is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day. New York City is home to so many iconic foods. But when the city that never sleeps wakes up for breakfast, they want a bagel with a cream cheese schmear piled high with locks. There's no other city that makes a bagel like a New York City bagel. I have not had good bagels in any other city. I came out the wounds eating bagels. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. If New York's known for anything, it's its bagels. And we got them all. Everything bagels. Rainbow bagels, pumpkin bagels, croissant bagels. And of course, you can't have them without a schmear. While the bagel first came from Poland, many food historians say its pairing with salmon and cream cheese originated right here in the Big Apple. In this town, few specialty food shops are as beloved and as historic as Russ and Daughters. I've been waiting in line probably 15, 20 minutes, but it's definitely worth it. I like the, the contrast of the flavor. It's like a nice little bagel with a with salty locks. They put the salmon and cream cheese together. Like, I try to make it at home, but it's nothing compared to Russ and Daughters. They've been serving premium smoked fish to hungry New Yorkers and folks from around the world for over 100 years. Just a few blocks from the store is the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Hi, Al. Hey, Al. how are you? Welcome to the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Nice to see it's you. It's great guys. to have you here. Thanks for having us. This is beautiful. Thank you. Nikki Russ Fetterman and Josh Russ Tupper are the grandchildren of the original daughters. These cousins are fourth generation owners carrying on their family's culinary legacy. So this is Russ and daughters. Wow. This is our great grandfather, Joel Russ, who started the business, his wife, Bella, and his three daughters. Wow. Um, we, Josh and I have the same grandmother and she was the youngest of the three. Was it unusual at that time for you? Because you usually would see so and so and sons, yeah. but to see Russ and daughters. Very unusual. But I mean, honestly, if he had had sons, it probably would have been Russ and sons. Well, thank like, goodness he did. We like exactly. to think of him as a feminist, but he was a good businessman. Joel Russ immigrated from Poland in 1907. And he started just standing on the streets of the Lower East Side selling schmaltz herring out of a barrel, and a family could feed itself for two nights with one fish. In 1914, he opened his first brick and mortar shop, J. Russ National Appetizing. Joel and his wife had three daughters, Patty, Ida, and Anne. When they turned 11, each daughter began working with their dad. What was their relationship like with him? I, because uh, he's your dad, but he's also your boss. your boss. Yeah, and I think he cared more about being the boss and the shopkeeper. He was a new immigrant to this country who was just trying to survive and make a place for his family. And that was his focus. And he saw his children as, as you know, cheap labor. The sisters grew up learning all aspects of the business. In 1935, Hattie, Ida, and Anne became Joel's partners. The shop was renamed Russ and Daughters, making it the first in America to bear and daughters in its title. When your great-grandfather decided to, to start Russ and Daughters, why the Lower East Side? After Ellis Island, this was the starting off point for the majority of poor Jewish immigrants. This is where they landed and they got their start. And so he was just feeding basic food 
to other poor immigrants like himself. At the turn of the century, this neighborhood was one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Many immigrants from all around the world lived in overcrowded tenement buildings, the conditions having a profound impact on their diets. One of the things about Lower East Side Jewish food is that a lot of food wasn't made at home. When you don't have running water and when you don't have uh, electric or gas stoves, it's really hard to do very much cooking. And so for, for women who are responsible for feeding their families, they had to get food from push carts, from restaurants, from bakeries. Joel Russ was one of many vendors catering to this new population. I've, I've always been curious, how did it come about, or from what you've heard, that somebody thought, hey, you know, here's this round bread, we'll put some fish on it, but oh, by the way, before we do, let's put some cream cheese, some dairy on it. Yeah. First of all, Russ and Daughters is the torchbearer of what's called appetizing. And this is a food tradition born here in New York, and it's the sister food tradition to delicatessen, both of which come up through the Jewish kosher dietary rules. You have to separate fish and dairy from meat. So a delicatessen, strictly speaking, is for meat. The appetizing store is where you go for fish and dairy, things like herring, smoked fish. When we say bagel and lox, most people are, you know, we're referring to a smoked salmon, but sure. the original bagel and lox was not with smoked salmon. Technically, lox, or belly lox, is salmon cured in salt, which preserves fish without refrigeration. There's no smoking involved, and it's incredibly salty, so it pairs perfectly with tangy cream cheese. But who was the first person to put lox on a bagel? So no one really knows how bagels, lox, and cream cheese all came together. We know that bagels come from Eastern Europe. We know that lox kind of comes basically from Nova Scotia, kind of. We know that cream cheese is an American food. But what we know is that these things come together as part of a compromise between different generations of American Jews. Jewish law prohibits cooking with most heat sources on the Sabbath. So the combo of bagels and lox created a filling meal for observant Jews to enjoy on the day of rest. It's good for a family, but you or your daughter-in-law didn't have to be spending the, the previous day cooking. As one of the country's oldest appetizing stores, Russ and Daughters has been serving kosher meals for generations. And the weekends are still their busiest days. I can't think really of th anything that's more New York than lox and bagels. I agree. I think that this is a food that came up through the Eastern European Jewish immigrants to New York. But now it's it transformed and just become New York food. It belongs to all New Yorkers. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
In the United States, women own less than 20% of all businesses. At the iconic Russ and Daughters, co-owner Nikki Russ Betterman is building on the legacy of her grandmother and great aunts. Growing up, you, you follow in the footsteps of, of strong women who may not have chosen this, but took it on and obviously made it really successful. What is it like for you following in those footsteps? It's a tremendous feeling to be now the and great-granddaughter. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a good customer of ours. Her family came from the Lower East Side. And she once said that before she knew the word feminist, when she looked up at the sign, Russ and Daughter, she understood that women could have an impact. Your family's business, Russ and Daughter, has survived two world wars, a depression. You're in the shadow of the World Trade Center. Yes. Why has this place been able to not just survive, but thrive? I think because in each generation there has been someone who wanted to do this. This is food that people turn to for comfort in hard times. And during the pandemic, we saw that you know, people were shipping Russ and Daughters all over the country to their loved ones because they couldn't be together. And so sending you know, bagels and lox and babka, say, you know, I love you, I miss you. Here, let me feed you. Having a schmear over Zoom. Oh, there was a lot of that. <laughs> Okay, so you can get smoked fish pretty much everywhere these days, but not quite like this. The salmon sold at Russ and Daughters is prized for its high fat content, from the milder Gaspe Nova to the smokier Scottish. And this gourmet fish is all sliced by hand. When you hold it up, I mean, it's it's almost translucent. That. Yeah, I think we should show you how we get it that then. Yeah, me and a sharp utensil, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> It takes up to six months of training to master the slicing technique here. So, Al, I hear you have some knife skills. Well, I've been in a fight or two, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, probably nothing like yours. So how, how long have you been slicing salmon? I've been at the store for 20 years. Wow. Um, so I've been slicing for a while. All right. So, so uh, I watch people slice, and I, uh, I'm amazed at, at how patient, because it seems like that's part of the, the skill. The reality is when you know how to slice, mm -hmm. it is one of the most relaxing things you can do. Very zen. Very zen. Ooh. Meditative, right? Mm. The trick is don't look anywhere on the fish. You have to really feel the fish. Be the fish. Be the fish, which is a very difficult concept to train yeah, someone. Good. Um, and particularly the first couple slices mm. are, don't be upset okay. if they don't look great. The idea is to make a consistently thick slice. You making so, faces at me? No, I'm just watching you not watch the fish. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Be the fish. Not looking. You should, you should look. I should you look. You got a sharp knife in your hand, Al. And you can see that as you change the angle of the knife, it changes the thickness. Yeah. Right? So now that's Drastically, a very... Drastically, more than a, you think. That's more than... Oh my gosh, that's a very thick slice. We call slice. those chuletas. Chuletas? Yeah. Chops. Ah. In Spanish. I was going to say, that sound, that, that didn't sound <laughs> Yiddish. Not, not that Yiddish. did not sound not Yiddish, Yiddish to me. No. Does the way you cut it affect the taste of it or the texture of it? The texture, which uh, affects the experience of the salmon. It's almost like you're eating the essence of salmon, not salmon. It's very delicate. It's a very appealing mm -hmm. texture and, and mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thinner. Josh, thanks so much. Nice meeting you. Such a pleasure to have you. Ah, smoke them if you got them. Up next, how fresh salmon gets turned into locks. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. 
rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. I'm here at the Acme Smoked Fish Factory. Now there is something fishy going on in there and you better believe I'm gonna find out what it is. The folks at Acme process, smoke, and pack nearly eight million pounds of fish every year. They sell to eateries all over the country, including Russ and Daughters. It smells of smoke and it smells of fish. That's the way it's supposed to be. It smells right. like New York City. Yes. All right, so as you know, in any food food plant, food safety is uh -huh. of paramount importance. Right. I see you got your boots on I here. just happen to be wearing these. Awesome. <laughs> I'll walk you through the process of how salmon turns into smoked salmon. Adam Kaslow is the fourth generation owner of Acme Smoked Fish. His great grandfather, Harry Brownstein, started selling fish after immigrating from Russia to Brooklyn. Wow. Harry started in the smoked fish business in the early 1900s, in 1906 to be exact. Out of, he, out of a push cart? Out of a, 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 a horse drawn wagon. Wow. He would go around buying fish from different smokehouses throughout Brooklyn and Queens and had himself the sales route. You know, he worked close to 45 years. I mean, his dream was to open up his own smokehouse, and it took him 45 years to finally achieve that. Wow. Adam now runs a massive smoked fish empire, supplying many of New York City's popular bagel shops, from H&H &H to Essa Bagel. Acme also selling to national grocers, like Trader Joe's. At the end of the day, uh -huh. it's all about the fish. We bring in fish from all over the world. Uh -huh. Smoked salmon is probably the most popular thing that we make, and our salmon come from different places, Norway, Scotland, Chile, and Alaska. It can take up to five days to make smoked salmon. Every order is made to the buyer's tastes, from the type of salmon to the curing method. The first step? cutting a whole fish into fillets. Whoa! Yeah, so this is a 12 kilo whole salmon Jeez. that I caught over here in Long Island Sound. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is an Atlantic salmon. Uh -huh. It's farm, farm raised. We use Atlantic salmon because it has the, the most fat and fat equals flavor when making smoked, smoked salmon. Right. So what are you cutting out the, like the backbone there? Yeah, this is your bone. Uh-huh. Carving into a fish this size requires expert hands. After the fish is filleted, it's preserved with salt. The fish is then treated with a wet brine or a dry cure. Okay, so let's dry, dry cure some, some salmon. Yeah. First thing, we're gonna get it onto the uh, raft. Okay. okay. So, see if you can pick up this salmon, grab it by the, by the, the tail. Okay. Grab with your other hand. And we're gonna lay it onto this the, the screen. Okay.
Perfect. Great. Step two, we're gonna grab a handful of salt. So it's just a thin layer. Yep. Right along the top of the dorsal. Like kind of down the center line, I suppose. And we'll give it a nice love, love tap. That's it? That's it. This fish is rather large. So traditionally, we would probably uh, wet brine uh -huh. this, this fish. But for smaller fish, the, the dry cure lasts about 24 hours. OK. That's a huge fish. Right. After curing, the fillets are cold smoked for up to 20 hours. This process imparts a subtle, smoky flavor. Let me show you how the smoker works. So these are a collection of that wood chip blend that we were uh, talking about earlier. There are different ways to smoke fish fillets. Hot smoking results in flaky, opaque fillets. Unlike traditional lox, smoked salmon is cold smoked below 85 degrees. This helps the fish retain its silky texture and makes it perfect for slicing. Ready to help me get this bad boy into the You oven? bet. All right. Hey, now. Let's close her up. Woo! Shut her down. After the smoker, the fish is cooled, then packed for shipping. What would your great-grandfather say if he could see all of this? I think he'd be amazed at how difficult it was for him to achieve his dream. Right. Now his descendants have been able to build upon that dream and build us into one of the preeminent smokers in the U.S. Up next, a vegan deli taking on tradition with plant-based lox and cashew cream cheese? Oh, you don't want to miss this. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it, I know that it can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter, in this closet. I took shelter, right in this closet, right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Back on the Lower East Side, two sisters, inspired by their Jewish heritage, are on a mission to make the food they loved growing up in a more sustainable way. Ladies, nice to meet you. Nice to meet Boom. you. Boom, want to show me around? Please, come Play, on in. Lead away. Erica and Sarah Kaberski are the co-owners of Orchard Grocer, an entirely vegan market inspired by classic delicatessens. This is our healthy cashew cream cheese. They want to make the vegan lifestyle easier for all. Right after college, they opened their first business, a shoe store called Moo Shoes. We opened our vegan shoe store 20 years ago. How are they? They're comfortable? About five years ago, we decided that we were going to update it by adding our vegan grocer, basically because it seemed like that's what our customers want. Um, after asking us what our shoes were made of, probably where should I go eat was um, the second most common question. So we decided to create an experience where they could just go eat next door. Growing up in Queens, 
The sisters' Jewish culture and food were closely linked. They had 10 Jewish delis in their neighborhood alone. Probably every Sunday, a tradition in our family, a dozen bagels um, at the bagel store. A dozen always meant 15. I don't know why that was, but and uh, with the cream cheese and lox, and that was just uh, how we spent our Sundays. Both sisters became vegan as teenagers, but felt they lost a piece of their roots by giving up certain foods. I think our parents were supportive of our changes to the vegan lifestyle. We grew up in a very culturally Jewish household, so all of our traditions were just based around food. Today, a lot of folks are going vegan for a variety of reasons, from reported health benefits to concerns over animal welfare. For the sisters, it's also a matter of global importance. Now we're watching climate change happen right now, and. I think that's causing a lot of people to think twice about what they're eating and how they are contributing. So it makes sense to us that it is becoming so mainstream. In 2017, Sarah and Erica saw not just an opportunity to satisfy a growing market, but to pay homage to their Jewish roots. We wanted to have a, a good sandwich selection that really epitomizes like New York deli food. So obviously a bagel and mox was gonna be there. Orchard Grocer sells a variety of vegan sandwiches, including Reuben's and tuna melts. But the sisters are most passionate about serving up a sense of nostalgia. People are so worried about giving things up. So I think just creating those alternatives and just something that people are familiar with and gives them that feeling of home. Yeah, like we haven't had to give up our Sunday tradition of um, bagels and lox. To help make their unique deli a reality, the sisters hired vegan chef Nora Vargas. Nora shares a passion for plant-based foods. She also knows how to turn carrots into salty lox. How did you come up? I mean, you have to think, okay, what can mimic uh, mm -hmm. a smoked salmon? Yeah. Uh, and so how did you, was it look like, like you yeah. thought, well, the only orange vegetable out there, <laughs> exactly. other than a sweet potato, <laughs> is carrot. We know the texture that we need to go for. We know the flavor that we want to go for so we started with the color and then we just kind of built it from there okay so let's get started I'm, I'm really fascinated okay all right I'm excited so we have prepared what do we have maybe 10 pounds of carrots here wow. for you these are huge these would have been huge carrots seriously yeah like wow. the size of my forearm but you <laughs> you have you have Slice them very thin on a mandolin? Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. All right, so we're all gloved up and we are going to, the next step in this process is to uh, apply our rub okay. to our carrots. So in here we have a mixture of sugar, salt, and the rest I can't tell you about. Oh, uh, it's a secret exactly. kind of thing. Yeah. So this, this would be kind of like the brine that you would mm -hmm. use, the dry brine that you would use yes. on fish. Exactly. Except yeah. it's going on vegetables. Yeah. We got our inspiration for a lot of different components of this recipe from the way that you would actually prepare fish if we were preparing fish and not carrots. Right. Coat everything. Hmm. Interesting. Oh no, don't smell it. Don't, don't figure out the secret just I'm, by smelling I'm, it. Okay, now. Because if I figure it out, she's going to have to kill me. <laughs> So I'm just going to start rubbing, just smushing everything in there. Once we get everything coated, we would let this sit for three to six hours, mm -hmm. probably. OK, great. So I think we've, I think we nailed it. OK. In here. That's another secret ingredient? Definitely. Jeez, yeah, a, but I can tell you. A lot you. of secrets here at Orchard. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit. Okay. Okay. So it's a combination of olive oil mm -hmm. and aquafaba. Aquafaba? Yeah. Are you familiar with that ingredient? I don't know. You know when you're opening up a can of beans right. and you got to drain them? Yes. The stuff that you drain out, that's aquafaba. Aquafaba. It's, like, it's bean water. It's bean, bean juice. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pour okay. and then you can kind of do the same process. Okay, that we same did before. process. Just squish it all in there, okay? Yeah, perfect. After we had let our carrots sit for three to six hours, right. um, we tossed them in the oven. So they bake. We like to call it cold smoking just ah. to sound like classy. Um, like the process of making smoked salmon. Exactly, yeah. That That's does right. look very much like smoked salmon. <laughs> and what would a bagel and lox be without the cream cheese? This vegan spread is made with raw cashews, salt, some secret spices, and coconut oil, all blended together with soft tofu. 
Shall we make a bagel? Sure, let's do it. Chai talk. Cheers. This is a really terrific idea. Thank I'm, you. Thank you for opening my eyes. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That yeah. was fantastic. Okay, a great way to finish things up. I mean, we've, we've seen the history, we've gone to the past, we were in the present, and you have brought us the locks and bagels of the future! <laughs> a bagel with cream cheese and smoked salmon is a uniquely American combination. Born from Jewish roots, transformed by local ingredients, and carried on by new generations, this breakfast tradition has truly stood the test of time when it comes to food in New York City. Welcome to our Today All Day special on climate change and solutions. One of the biggest issues facing us today, and we're exploring every angle as part of our growing Today Climate Initiative. It's a key part of our reporting every day, and now we are taking an even closer look at some of the women leading the charge to save our planet. Featuring pieces by our own Morgan Radford, Blaine Alexander, Kristen Dahlgren, and Ann Thompson. We'll showcase groundbreaking ways fashion designers are creating sustainable clothing. And new pushes for school buses to go electric. How students dealing with climate anxiety are turning fear into action. And we're going to meet some trailblazing female scientists at NASA using new technology to learn about the climate. Now, as we know, fashion trends may come and go pretty quickly, but the clothes that are actually churned out of that cycle last so much longer, and many are piling up in massive landfills. So NBC's Morgan Radford spoke to several women who are pushing the industry forward, finding creative ways to cut down on waste and help consumers stay fashionable and sustainable. Light, camera, and sustainable fashion. A new push for a cleaner, greener, more sustainable future from an industry long known for its impact on our environment. For someone who has never heard of sustainable fashion, how would you describe it to them? Well, sustainable fashion was born within the fashion industry in order to redress a social and an environmental balance. Orsola de Castro is the founder of Fashion Revolution, an organization encouraging fashion brands and consumers to reduce their global footprint. Why do you think fashion needs a revolution? We need to see an industry that is transparent, which is against all principle of the fashion industry. And within the word revolution, there is also the word evolution. And the fashion industry is an ancient industry that designed itself to be deliberately exploitative. Sounds a bit absurd, but in terms of modernity, the fashion industry is incredibly old fashioned. And the backlash from images like these have caused consumers to take notice. Right now, the fashion industry makes up 4% of carbon emissions and throws out about 92 million tons of clothes a year which is why 60% of fashion executives have already invested in or plan to invest in recycling materials. So it's a purple dye, um, a, little, a little forsythia slipped into yeah. there. Cara Piazza, a New York-based designer, runs her own small business, dyeing and recycling clothes with plant-based products and shipping them to consumers and larger suppliers. We will take your bouquets and your wedding arrangements from your wedding and then we create something that immortalizes the special day. How important is that reuse process in being sustainable? I think it's extremely important. I think it's the most important. Is that what you're doing? Are you reusing items that you dye? Our clients will send us their old garments. So like, let's say you have a t-shirt that has a stain on it. We can either rebundle dye it for you or throw it in one of our colors and then you have a new item. All plant-based dyes? Plant-based dyes, yes. Why is that important to you to do something that's healthier for the environment? That's a great question. So for me, I just don't feel like I have another choice. I think if we're going to be making something that we're putting um, out there, it's really important to do it with the most integrity that you can and in a way that really helps the planet. And she hopes bigger fashion houses will follow suit. Everlane is a clothing brand that prides itself on what it calls radical transparency, sharing with consumers where their products come from. Many companies don't 
even have visibility or know where their raw materials are being sourced from, sometimes where even their garments are being made. You know, people are always going to buy clothes. And I think we, we have to be able to do what we can within the supply chain and really work to start bettering it. And buyers are taking notice. A recent study showed that 43% of Gen Z consumers shop with sustainability in mind and are willing to spend 10% more on sustainable products. But another report found that while most want to help, 80% of overall shoppers still say getting the best value for their money is the top priority when buying. That's why budding designer Caro Butler, who's a student at the Fashion Institute of Technology, says for her generation, it's it's important to remind companies that fashion and conscious consumerism can happen at the same time. As a future leader in yeah. this industry, what would you say to current leaders who maybe don't get why sustainability is so important? I think uh, my generation will really set on the values that we want to see in brands. If a fashion brand wants to be successful in five to ten years, they have to enable sustainable practices, move towards a circular economy in order to keep that generation buying their products. That's why everything she's making comes from reused items. This is your professor's yes. discarded arm yes. sling, and yes. you're going to turn it into a closure for the, for the jacket. And I'm trying to figure out what to do with the rest of it. I haven't come up with a solution for that. Her professors say starting with this generation of students is the only way to make a real and lasting change. Well, you know, we are educating the next generation of leaders in the industry, and they are very committed to saving the planet and understand that as a society, we really cannot continue in the, in the way that we have uh, practiced and worked for the past number of years. Which is why sustainable ethics are woven into the school's curriculum. And how important is education in this process to achieving a sustainable future? You have to open their mind and make them aware of the steps that they are taking or not taking that are contributing to it or taking away from the issue. So I think it's, it's just the most important thing we can teach them right now. So this is ground zero when it comes to achieving a sustainable future. Correct. Because if you're not sending new young blood out into the industry that is made up of dinosaurs like me, um, you're not going to be able to create a new mentality. A push for a brighter future and a more sustainable one. If you're looking to help from your own closet, try repurposing your old clothes, like turning a t-shirt into a headband or a cleaning cloth, or repair what you have to give it a new life. And for donations that just can't be worn, try finding an organization that recycles fabrics. You've turned uh, t-shirts into, into like into a blanket. Into a blanket. That's right. And this I rented. That's right. And, and this <laughs> needs to be old t-shirts. Uh, uh, now on to schools and the buses that bring millions of our kids back and forth every day. So many districts across the country are hoping to make a big change. The U.S. Transportation sector accounts for almost a third of the nation's greenhouse gas emissions and approximately half a million school buses make up the country's largest public transportation network. One national parent-led organization is pushing for all electric zero emission school buses. NBC's Blaine Alexander took a ride on one to learn about all the changes coming. For generations, it's been a school day staple. The resounding rumble of the big yellow bus. But some advocates hope that will soon change. The biggest thing you hear right off the bat is it's so much quieter. Here in Fulton County, Georgia, this school bus is completely electric. No engine, no fuel, and perhaps most notably, no harmful tailpipe emissions. Where the normal fuel door would be sure. for a regular diesel bus, comes over. Plug in instead. Just plugs in. There we go. This Metro Atlanta school district added its very first electric bus to its fleet last year. But environmental advocates like Almeda Cooper hope it's the first of many more like it. So being on this bus, does this bring back memories? It does, it does, <laughs> yeah. it does. Cooper is a national field manager with Moms Clean Air Force, a national group of parents who have made it their mission to fight air pollution and climate change. What is it about the nature of a school bus that makes them so concerning to you? We're talking about 25 million children riding them twice a day. It's idling, it's standing, it's waiting, and those tailpipe fumes, which are dangerous and harmful to breathe, are going into the air. That's not good for any child. 
She says the harm stretches far beyond the schools as buses crisscross through neighborhoods and on city streets and highways. In fact, the air quality in Fulton County, the most populous county in Georgia, has received a failing grade from the American Lung Association. Transportation is the largest contributor to global warming and to poor quality of air that we have. And the traffic that we have in Atlanta is notorious and lots of it. Yeah, traffic. Traffic. Yeah. Including school buses. Including school buses, yes. Mm -hmm. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, exposure to diesel exhaust can cause serious health conditions like asthma and respiratory illnesses and can worsen existing heart and lung disease, especially in children and the elderly. When do you first remember having an asthma attack? I first remember in elementary school, early on. 17-year-old Rain Blassingame and her mom, Katrina, know the value of clean air all too well. A lifelong athlete, Rain, suffered from debilitating asthma as a young girl. Her mom says the attacks would often get bad in the fall. As they continued year after year, I just noticed, oh, it's happening at this time of the year, every year, at the beginning of school. Did you turn your attention to diesel run buses at one point? You know, as I look back now, as we're getting more information about the pollution that diesel school buses um, emit in the air, maybe we know the school buses, the windows are down, the kids want, they think they're getting fresh air inside the bus. And really, it's the pollution is just coming inside the bus where they are. So electric school buses would cut down on that. and. We know the effects that pollution has on kids, like rain. It's an issue that's gotten the attention of the Biden administration. The newly passed infrastructure bill earmarks $5 billion over the next five years to help send thousands of electric and low emission school buses to districts across the country. In Fairfax County, Virginia, school officials are working to transition the district's entire fleet, the second largest in the nation, to electric buses by the year 2035. It's a goal applauded by EPA Administrator Michael Regan. Fairfax County Public Schools is demonstrating exceptional leadership in being an early participant in what we hope will be a widespread nationwide movement. Zero emission school buses can and one day will be the American standard. Of the nation's more than half a million school buses, electric models make up less than 1%. And industry insiders say transitioning the entire fleet will require more funding and an energy system overhaul. I think the federal funding is something I'd hit as a, as a super first step. When you get into the broader you know, needs of converting to um, or converting away from a petrol fuel system to an electric system, you know, there, there are massive amounts of energy infrastructure requirements that are only beginning to be assessed in my estimation. But for kids like Rain, it's a change that can't come soon enough. So people who have asthma like I did don't have to worry about it as much and they won't have as many asthma attacks, especially if they have it around the same time during school. Just less pollution in general would help out with anyone who has asthma. Just better air to breathe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just this month, Boston's mayor announced the city would replace its entire fleet of school buses with electric vehicles by 2030. Now, while electric buses may cost more up front, they'll save a lot on the backside of this with maintenance and fuel down the line. And with gas prices these days, that payoff could come even sooner. <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, up next on our Today Climate Special, we are going to explore how young people are taking action, not just for the environment, but for their mental health, too. Global mean Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Yeah, who's this? Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia, could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Yeah, who's this? What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter, in this closet? I took shelter, right in this closet, right here. 
rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to Today Climate and the new issues and solutions that are now underway. Study after study shows climate change weighs heavily on younger generations and that fear for the planet's future is even driving some to seek therapy. NBC's Kristen Dahlgren spoke to students about the toll on their mental health and how a new generation is turning anxiety into action. On the lush green campus of the University of Vermont, nature feels like it's always just steps away. But for many students, so does climate change. I feel like you can't really think about a lot without thinking about climate change and the worry that comes with that. Emma Wardell is a 21-year-old student here, suffering from a phenomenon so common it's been labeled eco-anxiety, emotional distress caused by climate change. That could be anxiety-provoking, especially when it's constantly looking at the threat of catastrophes. She's not alone. Who here has suffered from eco-anxiety? Definitely. Definitely yeah. yep, sure. All three of you. Well, to me, it was just kind of like, like a feeling of like helplessness. I honestly get a sense of pure sadness sometimes. I feel like I've for a long time always had that kind of dread. A 2021 study of 10,000 young people around the world found that an overwhelming majority were at least moderately worried about climate change. More than half reported emotions like sadness, anxiety, powerlessness, and guilt. And three in four said they thought the future was frightening. What will the future be? Will we have a future? Like, are humans gonna like make it, you know? Um, so those kind of questions are really, really heavy. Do you feel like your generation's been left to save the world? Yeah, I feel like a lot of the pressure has been put on us. We feel that pressure and that's kind of like dictating our actions and our, and our steps towards the future. For some, it has become such a burden, they are rethinking reproducing. On one hand, I'm sure I'll want to someday, but on the other hand, like, like what lives would those children live? I'm not sure if I'll have children on my own, but it is pretty tragic that we're actually reevaluating. I don't know if I can really rationalize having kids in the kind of environment that we currently have and that we're creating. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to grapple with the fact that something that you might have want, once wanted, you can no longer have, not because of anything that you yourself might have done, but because like the world has kind of made it so. We ask at our intake sessions about different things that might worry kids and teens, and um, climate change has been a topic that's come up quite a bit, just anecdotally. Dr. Kelsey Hudson is a clinical psychologist and researcher at Boston University who, like an increasing number of clinicians, now treats young people for eco-anxiety. So really what we're trying to do is help therapists become trained in how to talk about climate change. There's a kind of a growing understanding that government inaction is correlated with climate distress. How important is it that young people, or, or really anyone, I guess, recognize that this eco-anxiety is real, it's a thing, and to, to seek treatment if they're feeling some of these feelings. Experiencing climate-related emotions is a very natural and reasonable response to this huge crisis. Emma now sees a therapist who specializes in eco-anxiety, and she's joined an environmental club that she says has turned into a sort of climate support group. Clubs like hers are popping up at schools and in communities all around the country for a generation that's turning their climate fear into action. There's got to be more action and less talk. I like to frame it as we've been drafted into the climate fight. The fact that I'm dedicating myself to this um, kind of is empowering in a way. What types of things do you find help you? It's kind of simple, but just like being out in nature, like really, if you're feeling worried or sad or anxious about the environment, go out and be with the environment. 
a way to refresh and maybe see things through a new lens. Do you have hope that we as a planet can still reverse things and, and make changes necessary? I do have a lot of hope because I just don't accept that as our reality. Just the people that I'm going to school with and, and that I'm inspired by every day, just seeing how passionate and motivated they are about their beliefs and what they're trying to do, I can't help but feel hopeful for our future. Wow, it seems like there is some great hope for the future mm. if these are the students who are leading it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, coming up next on Today Climate, we are going to introduce you to four incredible women at NASA studying climate change. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? There's a Supreme Court nominee. What would it take for you to vote to confirm her? So I guess the question is, can this end with sanctions alone? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world, because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Now, at Today Climate, we're spotlighting the women on a mission to save our warming world. NASA's Earth Science Division studies our planet's climate by conducting missions here on Earth and up in space. Ann Thompson went to NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, to learn more about the trailblazing women leading these impressive efforts. As the consequences of our warming world become ever more apparent, these four NASA scientists, all women, work to understand what's happening now and reveal what could happen in the future. From a scientific standpoint, is the world facing a climate crisis? Well, certainly the changing climate and the distributed effects are creating challenges around the world. And we see those extremes happening now, right? We see more pervasive drought, we see extreme rainstorms, we see changing nature of hurricanes. This is not a future problem. No, this is happening today. We see it day in and day out across the Earth system. Leslie Ott is a climate scientist looking at where the carbon dioxide we create goes. Dahlia Kirschbaum focuses on climate change and landslides. Some of the work that I do is looking at how landslides may be impacted by more extreme rainfall around the world. Lola Fatoyimbo studies the role of forests and coastal marshes. As they are making oxygen, they are taking up carbon dioxide and they are storing all that carbon in their vegetative uh, matter. So they're allies in the battle against climate change. Absolutely. Leading them, Karen St. Germain, the director of Earth Science for NASA. NASA uses the unique vantage point of space and that allows us to look at the whole Earth as a system. And that's the key to really understanding climate change. NASA itself is changing. 
50 years ago in 1972, women made up 2.5% of NASA's permanent science and engineering force. Today, they account for just over 24%. Should people be surprised that there are four women working on climate science at NASA? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere I, I go, working with the, uh, the scientists at NASA, I see uh, women, I see people of all different races and ages, and I, I, think, uh, I think that's so important because that diversity of uh, experience, life experience, leads people to ask different questions. What is the barrier you see for young women to follow in your footsteps? I think it's really important for young women and young students in general to know that you can be yourself, whoever you are, however you are, and still be a NASA scientist. For these four women, the pursuit of science is rooted in the personal. Lola is the mother of two boys. One of the key roles that we play as scientists is to not only do the science, but also to communicate it and to teach it to the next generation. Dahlia has three children. I work with my kids to talk about math and science so they're not scared. They really want to lean in and understand it. Leslie was inspired by her scientist parents. This was my parents' language for understanding the world, and that's what I grew up with, and I think that's really shaped, you know, where I am today. Karen, from what she saw as a climate researcher. My earliest research in, uh, in Earth science was looking at Arctic ice, and it's been shocking to me how much Arctic ice has, uh, has shrunk over the years. Now to help them understand the oceans and atmosphere, a new satellite mission called PACE for plankton, aerosol, cloud, and ocean ecosystem. Here, let me give you a sneak peek of the satellite. As you can see, it's a work in progress, but once it's finished and launched, it will orbit the Earth every 90 minutes. It will completely cover the planet in two days, and it's expected to stay in space a minimum of three years. Beth Weinstein is the project manager. Hey, Beth. Hi. Ultimately, all those three instruments together, what will they tell scientists about what's happening here on Earth? I mean, we're really just trying to understand how all these um, large parts of the Earth work together. How do the oceans work with the atmosphere? How does the changing ocean affect what's going to happen to us? So there's a lot of scientific questions that, um, that we hope to answer with our uh, mission. Though daunting, these scientists believe the solutions to climate change are within our reach. Our endeavor, Earth Science, really is an international endeavor. So we partner with agencies around the world, all because when we work together, we can do more than the sum of what each could do individually. We can be more ambitious, and we think the challenges we're facing really, really demand that ambition. Is that a template for solving climate change, for stopping climate change? I think absolutely. Because the Earth works as a whole system, we have to work together, and that can start with working together to understand what's happening. So this is so cool because NASA's Earth observations are freely available to anyone who wants to use their data and can even help study our planet's climate by acting as a citizen scientist. And that's it for us and our Today Climate Special. Climate change is real and complex, but with the tireless work of the amazing people we showcase today and the others that are still working out there, we know that there's definitely hope. It does feel like there's some hope. Thanks to Anne, Morgan, Kristen, and Blaine for sharing these important stories today and check out today every day on all of our platforms for the very latest on our environment and how we can navigate our changing planet together. Bye-bye. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here.
rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? There's a Supreme Court nominee. What would it take for you to vote to confirm her? So I guess the question is, can this end with sanctions alone? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The Today Show's newest fan. Al Roker. How's yeah. it feel being in this this national park? Well, you know what? We get out of the city and we're among trees and woods and critters. I feel better. So, Mr. President, you, you've got this new series. Uh, it looks at not just our national parks, but national parks around the world. Species found nowhere else on Earth. Join me in this celebration of our planet's greatest national parks and wilderness. After looking at all this, does this give you hope that, that these parks, these places of refuge, are? are kind of a, a buffer, in a sense, against what we see on the outside world, including climate change. Well, one of the great things about national parks is they belong to everybody. And you know, one of the reasons I wanted to do this show uh, about these great national parks is this is really one of America's great exports. Teddy Roosevelt designated Yellowstone as a, as a national park. We had one. Now, around the world, there are 4,000 great national parks. and what we do is we look at the variety of landscapes from you know, Monterey Peninsula and, and the amazing waters that are filled with all kinds of sea animals that are, are continually replenishing our air and our water down to Savo in Africa, this massive park you know, that's full of uh, lions and you know, elephants and, and uh, amazing creatures. But part of what we also see in these national parks is how people are learning to take care of these uh, amazing landscapes, but also the dangers that are posed by human encroachment. And, and I'm hoping that uh, by us reminding ourselves of how precious uh, these resources are, uh, that you know, we're gonna learn something, not just about how to maintain national parks, but why it's so important to deal with issues that, like climate change that threaten the entire planet. We, we have younger kids, we, uh, uh, Sasha and Malia, that this generation right. that demands us being better caretakers. Yeah. Will people seeing this heed that call? One, one of the uh, amazing things about the footage, it reminds you of the incredible biodiversity of our planet. But we are continually losing species, we're losing plants, we're losing uh, the land on which they thrive. And as you point out, Al, I think that the, the generation of, of our kids are more mindful of uh, how we haven't always taken care of the planet. Uh, and with climate change affecting everything, uh, they are demanding action. And my hope is that what this show does is not only remind us why we need to act, but also gives you some indication of the ways in which we can actually restore and mm -hmm. rebuild some of these landscapes that were devastated. You think about even here in the United States, 
uh, a place like Yellowstone where uh, for a while there were almost no bison. Uh, they were right on the verge of extinction. Uh, and now when you go into these national parks, you have entire herds that yeah. are you know, running across the plains. Um, nature is more resilient than we think if we are intentional about it. Uh, but uh, you know, when you look at the recent reports, for example, from the International uh, Panel on Climate Change, the window for us to act uh, to ensure that we don't have cataclysmic climate change, mm -hmm. that window's closing and we're going to have to seize on it. You, know, you, as a boy, went to national parks right. and you've gone with the family. Right. Is that one of the impetuses for this? Part of what I want us to do is to, uh, as families, rediscover uh, this amazing treasure that we have because I think back to my own youth. I was lucky enough to live in, when I was a kid in Hawaii. The whole state almost is a, is a national park. Uh, and so the oceans, the coral reefs, the mountains, the forests, uh, th that was part of my everyday life. Yeah. And uh, you know, part of what we do in this show is track some of the areas like Indonesia, Kenya, Patagonia, places where I've traveled, but it stirred when I was a child a sense of how big the world was mm -hmm. uh, and how interconnected we all are. Speaking of being interconnected, I mean, we've, we, climate is one of those things that gets pushed down yes. when things happen. For example, in, in, now we've got Ukraine right. and there's a talk about let's ramp up production of, of fossil fuels because, right. you know, inflation, higher gas prices. Do you worry that that's you know, going to push back the initiative? Well, interestingly, when we see what's happened with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it argues for us redoubling our efforts to wean ourselves off fossil fuels. Russia uh, is emboldened and empowered in part because they think we have to buy their oil and gas. And one of the things I've been very uh, encouraged by, because it's not easy to do, is, is the Biden administration's ability to mobilize Europe, countries like Asia and Korea, uh, to say not only that we're going to sanction Russia for this vicious and unjustified invasion of an independent country, but also that we now have to think about how do we revamp our energy mm -hmm. uh, so that we are no longer dependent on these fossil fuels. It's not just that it is contributing to uh, the heating of our planet. It's also that uh, it ends up empowering folks that uh, we don't want empowered. Speaking of uh, Vladimir Putin, you're one of the few people who've been in the room with him. Is, is this the, what, what you see happening now? Is this the Vladimir Putin that you had to deal with? Putin has always been ruthless uh, against his own people as well as uh, others. Um, he has always been somebody who's wrapped up in uh, this twisted, distorted sense of grievance and uh, ethnic nationalism. That part of Putin, I think, uh, has, always, uh, has always been there. Uh, what we've seen with the invasion of Ukraine is him being reckless in a way that um, you might not have anticipated mm -hmm. eight, ten years ago, but uh, you know, the danger was always there. And I think that, as I said, uh, the encouraging thing has been the extraordinary courage of the Ukrainian people, mm -hmm. uh, but also the ways in which uh, the majority of the world yeah. has been repulsed by it and is reacting to it. We're all going to have a part to play in not only helping the Ukrainian people, but also looking at some of these larger trends. How can we uh, reduce our dependence on fossil fuels so that we can shift to a more clean energy future? That's going to be good for all of us. You talk about the current administration. You were just at the White House for the first time in yeah. five years. How did, how did that feel? You know, it was wonderful to see some of the old team, uh, people who... Uh, you know, we interacted with every day for eight years, worked so hard. Folks who looked after us, not just the policy people, but the staff that do the little things every day to, to make uh, your life easier. The fact that I could leave, though, was nice. <laughs> <laughs> Were you surprised? That a lot of people, I think, when you made the, joke, the, vice, the Vice President Biden joke, were you a little surprised that people were like, hey, what's up with that? No, you, you know, look, uh, President Biden and I have 
uh, an extraordinary friendship as well mm -hmm. as a professional relationship. Um, you know, our families know each other. Our, uh, his grandkids are close friends with my daughters. Um, and uh, and I, I think that, you know, he understands what I came to understand when I was president, which is each of us, um, when we occupy that seat, uh, you know, we're, we're relay runners. You know, we're, we're trying to move the ball forward. Uh, issues are tough. It's, it's not always easy, but, uh, um, you know, if we've got good people around us and, and a good team, mm -hmm. uh, we can get things done, and I think they're getting good, th good stuff done. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. You talk about, uh, back in 2010, you talked about with the midterms, it, we took a shellac, you took a shellac. Yes. Uh, what do you think is going to happen in this, this midterm election? Well, it's too early to say. I mean, we're still far away. Uh, I, I will say this. Uh, I think uh, the Biden administration has overcome some extraordinary circumstances. Uh, COVID, the economy, and now most recently Ukraine, and they have handled the policy right. Um, but look, understandably, people feel exhausted by COVID. That was a traumatic experience for a lot of people, mm -hmm. uh, even tougher on a lot of working families right. who didn't have the option of Zooming from home uh, when it came to work. And, and and people who've lost loved ones, uh, so that was tough, and and that's going to create uh, that's going to dampen the mood of a country. Mm -hmm. Inflation is a real issue. A lot of it is having to do with the COVID and supply chains, and now uh, Putin's gas tax, essentially, uh, by virtue of uh, his invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but the underlying economy, there's a good story to tell. I mean, unemployment is close to record lows. Uh, wages are up. People are, are finding jobs, and and so, uh, you know, what I've said consistently is mm -hmm. Democrats have to uh, go out there and, and tell yeah. the story, um, and and you know we'll see how it plays out. Ultimately, the voters decide on this thing. The the one thing I I always uh, that I learned, I guess, uh, from my own experience, is uh, you know, typically in in any election. Uh, you know, you've got to tell a story that people mm -hmm. uh, find compelling. And, and uh, uh, you know, you wish sometimes if you built a better mousetrap that people would beat a path to your door. But sometimes you've got to go out there and show, the them what out a, there. <laughs> show them what a good mousetrap this thing is. You know, you mentioned COVID. You, uh, 80 million Americans, you've tested positive yeah. for it. How are you feeling? I feel fine. I, I mean, I look, I was fortunate that I did not get it until I had been vaccinated, mm -hmm. I had been boosted, uh, and I barely had symptoms. Um, and you know, this is one of the arguments that, uh, for, you know, for those who are still hesitating about getting a vaccination, uh, because they say to themselves, well, you got vaccinated uh, and you still got COVID, I barely had any symptoms. Uh, and, and the risk of hospitalization or you know, long COVID symptoms 
uh, that linger on for years uh, are an awful lot lower uh, if you take advantage of this modern medical miracle yeah. uh, that now has been tested on mm -hmm. probably about a billion people uh, <laughs> with, with uh, almost no evidence of any uh, significant side effects. Uh, this is something that I hope people continue to take seriously and continue to take advantage of. Post-presidency, what has life, how has life changed for you, Michelle, yeah. Sasha, and Malia? Well, there's nothing that, com that compares to the privilege and honor of serving the American people in the highest office of the land. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are times where I miss the work. There are times where I miss the incredible camaraderie that you build with a team of people who are incredibly dedicated, working amazingly hard, um, and you're in the foxhole together, right? Uh, the, the, the adrenaline that comes with that and, and the, the uh, team spirit that comes with that. Uh, I don't miss the hoopla, though. <laughs> I, I, I don't miss uh, uh, the confinement. And, uh, and, you know, we're finding that we can be really uh, productive, uh, contributing citizens in all kinds of other ways. Uh, my work and Michelle's work with the foundation, we're training a whole new set of uh, leaders all around the world and here in the United States uh, who are interested in figuring out how do we solve big mm -hmm. problems like climate change. Um, our ability to do projects like this one with the great national parks, which, by the way, not only is, are we do we have a show on Netflix, but we're also partnering with uh, you know, the Wildlife Conservation Society uh, with something called uh, Wild for All. Uh, and you can go on a website, Wild for All, and find out ways in which you, viewers can actively participate mm -hmm. in helping to build uh, a con conservation mindset and, and appreciate our national parks. So, uh, there are a lot of fun things that we're able to do, but things that I think are meaningful as well, and I hope uh, you know we can uh, are able to continue to do. During your presidency, you protected more public lands, more waterways yeah. than any uh, previous administration. Now that you are a private citizen, yeah. is is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? I think it has to be one of uh, the top priorities for all of us. Look. Um, you and I were fortunate enough growing up, and, and it didn't, almost didn't matter where you were on the planet, where as we were coming of age, an environmental movement came about. You know, uh, if you were a little older than us and you were living in LA, you couldn't breathe because yeah. of the smog. Uh, if you were a little older than us and you were living in Chicago, uh, the Sh Chicago River caught on fire because of the environmental movement. All of us ended up living happier, healthier lives. And that was passed on to us because of the work of a generation before us. The threat of climate change is many times over a bigger threat than pollution was. Because if we start seeing temperatures tip to a point in which uh, we can't reverse them uh, and oceans start rising as you know better than anybody, uh, the climate patterns and the jet stream, huge global systems start changing. Um, the, the, the consequences for all of us, farmers, people who live on coastlines, uh, you know, the consequences for public health, insect-borne diseases, mass migration, conflict, uh, those things are going to uh, accelerate. And so I don't want to live uh, I, I don't want to leave that kind of legacy for my kids uh, and my grandkids, and I don't think any of us do. And so that means that we've got to get to work. And the good news is that we have on the shelves right now technologies that, if we deployed them, wouldn't completely eliminate the gas out, uh, greenhouse gases that are causing climate change, but would tampen them down and give us more time to create new energy sources. It's just a matter of will. And, and us getting ourselves organized. And we're gonna to have to do that here in the United States as a major contributor to these greenhouse gases. We've got to set a good example. And then we're gonna to have to help mobilize the world. And that's not easy to do, but mm -hmm. we've done hard things before. 
Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? There's a Supreme Court nominee. What would it take for you to vote to confirm her? So I guess the question is, can this end with sanctions alone? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? There's a Supreme Court nominee. What would it take for you to vote to confirm her? So I guess the question is, can this end with sanctions alone? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. One last question uh, on a personal note. Uh, our son Nick is getting ready to go to college. He's yeah. about to leave. Deborah and I are like, oh, I can't believe this. You, you've been through it. Uh, you got any tips for, for us as far as empty nesting? Uh, well, first tip is um, you are going to uh, weep copiously when you drop uh, <laughs> Nick off at college, but you can't let him see you cry. So you, you drop him off and then you quickly leave and then you cry in the car. That's tip number one, because you don't want them to feel bad as sure. they're getting all excited about their new life. You'll feel horrible. Um, Thank you. Tip number two is um, you try to bribe them with like nice trips. Hey, we're going to Hawaii. You guys want to come so that they show up and, 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 and uh, uh, keep the refrigerator stocked because they can't afford, you know, <laughs> fresh fruit and things like that. Um, <laughs> But look, seriously, uh, Michelle always said, and, and she's absolutely right about this, our job as parents is to, to teach our kids not to need us. And it hurts, but when you see them as accomplished, confident, kind, thoughtful, responsible people, then you know you've, you've done your job. And, uh, and it turns out that you know, after they've been away from you for a little while, they kind of remember, oh, I, I, I sort of like them. And they start showing up again. Absence makes the heart grow fine. Absolutely. <laughs> You'll survive. Thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate you. Appreciate Good it. Good luck. Thank you. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? There's a Supreme Court nominee. What would it take for you to vote to confirm her? So I guess the question is, can this end with sanctions alone? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. 
Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You know, part of why I'm excited about this show is, is so many of us uh, are removed mm -hmm. from nature right. most of the time. And... One of the great inventions of America uh, that has now been exported around the world is our national parks. And, so. and I know you spent time as a kid in national parks. I and did. We've got some great kids What's going here on, guys? From the Boys and Girls Club to Greater Washington. Hey! I'm Joseph and I'm in third grade. And the former president is also hoping to inspire the next generation to get involved with national parks and share his love of nature. So we led some local kids on a scavenger hunt. It was very nice to meet you. And mom made you put on a tie today, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's okay, it looks sharp. Uh, is this Team Roker over yes, here? Yes, it's Team, team Roker. Roker. Uh, team Roker! Uh, you guys, you guys, uh, you know. I want to be on your team. No, no. you know what, Roker, Roker's team, he knows, he knows a lot about this stuff. So I think you guys will be all right with Team Roker. We got this Let's see, Team Obama, though. Hey, hey Team Obama. Obama. Yes, sir. Oh. Nice to meet you. What's your name, He's sir? He's come to play. Joel? Very nice to meet have you. To take his team down. What grade are you in? Boom. Well, I, I am very excited Boom. about our what kind of treasure hunt we got going here. A scavenger hunt. We're gonna go find stuff that's on our list, right? Yes, sir. And, and, okay. and Ranger Aaron's gonna explain it all. This thing. Where's my Where's my clipboard? All right, Andrew Rand, How are we gonna do this? Well. You got to set the expectation that this team is going to win. So, Obama, hey. Team Obama going to win? Yeah. No! no. Yeah. Is Team Obama going to win? Yeah! yeah. yeah. All right, one, two, three. Oh, ready, oh. set, scavenge. Here oh. we go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's go. Does anyone see any yellow flowers? Uh, no. You see some yellow flowers? Yes, I see them right huh? there. Right there. Are yellow you flowers. Oh, yeah. I'm going to check that off our list. Okay. I see. Trees on here, that's kind of easy. Am I right? Oh, I think that counts. Yeah. I think that counts. That's, that's big. That's bigger than a kid's arm stand. Why don't you guys, let's make sure we're going to right. What about a uh, big tree bigger than your arm span? Who can find a big tree that they can't yeah. hug? You, you can't, can't hug the tree. Can you hug that? In the animal kingdom, it is the male that is looks fancier, is more colorful, etc., because they're trying to attract the female. Oh, yeah. See? <laughs> so the wood duck we have here, it's That's brilliant greens and blues and oranges, all kinds of different color feathers. So I think that means that it must be a male duck. Don't yes, sir. Okay. Is Correct. this fungi? It is. Yeah. So does anybody know the difference between a fungi and a moss? Ranger, well, you? Fungi? Yeah. Is this going to be a fungi pun? Is this going <laughs> to no, be like... <laughs> no, it wasn't a dad joke. I was actually asking <laughs> the serious. You see any? You see any? Oh, there's a one. Is that a bluebird? There's a bird. I saw a bird right there. They're right there. Right there on the branch. Oh, we got this checked off our list. Let's go. And I hear some birds. So this is now a peak bird. migration, spring migration for birds. And there's, if you, uh, birders who like to check birds off list, kind of like what we're doing, they want to attract the birds closer to them so that they can see those birds. That's how the way you can identify birds is by, like we were talking about the ducks, by looking at their their feathers, right? And so to attract birds, you can you can fish by using your mouth. Right? And then the birds are curious or interested as to what that noise is and they can come closer so that they're easier to identify. Okay. Or yep. Or you can use a bird call. Oh have you guys tried this? No. You wanna try it? Well I'll try it with sugar. It okay, makes so like how a do you do? Out. Twist. Oh, Sounds like a bird, doesn't it? Whales that migrate all the they swim all the way down from Alaska. Aren't and then they born? swim all the back. I, I was born in Hawaii, yeah. Is that cool like an H or an Honolulu. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Thank you. See you, you know more than some people about where I was born. Alright, so this is skunk cabbage, guys. And why do you think they call it skunk cabbage? Because it, it smells bad. bad. Well let's have Mr. Al Roker see how it well, smells. Gee, why me? <laughs> Oh my, oh. that's not Ooh. good. That smells Ooh. just like this. Has anybody smelled a skunk before? 
piano. No, yeah. It's a, you don't want to smell this. this is, we already this smelled is, it. Let's pass it around. Let's yeah, pass everybody it. take a whiff. Take a whiff of that. It's not that bad. Ooh. Wow. You hang around with some smelly people. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's pass it around. What does she? Ooh, is this the cabbage like you eat at home? To find a former president. Hmm. Does anybody know where there's a former oh, president? Yeah. Where? I think uh, oh. Team Obama. We've got to take advantage of something. One of the things on our list is a weather expert. So we're going to grab this guy. Uh -oh. I'll take a quick picture. Please. Do we have to take a pledge? Yep, we oh. must take a pledge and uh, raise our right we hand. We should stand up for this. Yes. All right, everyone stand up. All right. Raise your right hand. Everybody ready? Everybody good? Everybody got their right hand up? All right. All and right. repeat after me, loud and clear. Okay. As the Junior Ranger. As a, as junior, a junior Ranger. Ranger I, promise I, I promise to learn. I promise to learn. About the world around me. About the world around me. Explore the national parks. Explore, explore the, the national, national parks. Park. And help protect the natural and cultural. And, and help protect the natural and cultural. And historic resources. resources and historic resources. Of the national park system. Of the, the national, national park system. system. They, they will be here forever. So that they, they will be, be here forever. You now are officially junior rangers. Oh, yeah. yeah. Congratulations. All right. Man, and they get badges too? Get wow, badge. very cool. Woo. And a certificate. everybody, welcome to today's Pop Star Plus. Coming up on the show, our conversation with one of the stars of Selling Sunset. Emma Hernan gave us the scoop on the drama, of course, and also the real estate on the show. Plus, we're going to dive more into a very British scandal with stars Claire Foy and Paul Bettany. We're also going to look back at the Sandlot. If you can believe it, it's turning 29. And later, we're celebrating the legendarily Shirley MacLaine with a moment from our vault. That is all coming up after we get to what's first up today. Emma Hernan is a businesswoman and real estate agent featured in the show, Selling Sunset. The show gives a glimpse inside the real life LA real estate market through a high powered brokerage. And Emma spoke to us about the relationships, all the drama, and of course, the big homes from the latest season. I think the new season is even better than the last season. I think it's a 10 out of 10. I'm so excited for everyone to watch and I'm really excited to hear the feedback and the thoughts from all the fans and everyone that watches. And, you know, I'm really excited. Everyone gets to see a little bit more of my personal life and also my personality, you know, and see I'm a little daredevil. <laughs> okay. What is honestly wrong with you? Patrick will like this. I'm already here. You have to get the picture. If I take the picture where you get all on there, I will get off. I will oh get off. Oh my god. You do oh my god, I can't believe you just did that. I go above and beyond, you know, in everything I do for my clients, you know, for my business, for any investment that I probably I would be like jumping out of a helicopter arriving to a broker's open, you know, if it was gonna sell the house. I pretty much would do anything. <laughs> Call me lady. this season versus last season was a little bit different just because I feel like, you know, my toes had now been, you know, dipped in the water. So I kind of knew what I was getting into. But, you know, we actually filmed season four and five back to back. Nice, nice to meet, meet you. you. I always get what I want. <laughs> I just love this view. And I just love looking down on people. The little people. Hi, Hi cousins. cousins. Well, Chelsea did not need my fashion advice. She came with it and she brought it. We became really close, surprisingly. Um, but she's really, you know, Chelsea's really intelligent. We have a really close bond and relationship, so I'm really excited to have her. I mean, if I could have handpicked someone, it would have been her. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thanks. Uh huh. Bye. Hi, Mary. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Pretty in pink, Al Woods. Oh. <laughs> I know, it kind of is Al Woods, isn't it? We were I all gossipy and talking, and then you came in, and we were like, 
Uh, but like, we didn't even mean to be. Like, literally, I'm not we, that mean. No, we were just like, I'm telling you, we we must like you as a boss because clearly we like to pay yes, attention when you're here. Aww. I mean, who wouldn't want to have one of your really good friends as your boss? And she does a really good job of balancing friendship, but also, you know, she, at the end of the day, she is the boss, so she has to make sure things are done properly, and she does have to answer to Jason. So she wants to make sure that she goes above and beyond, and I think she's done a phenomenal job at stepping in and you know really taking control and we are not an easy group of girls to come in and and, and manage so i mean kudos to mary she's done a great job these girls on the show yeah we do a tv show together but at the end of the day these girls are like family and they're people that you know are going to be in my wedding one day and things like that which i think is so rare you don't always get that popping bottles <laughs> Hey, popping bottles. In case we get a little wild, <laughs> some shots. Micah mostly lives in Texas, but when he's been here in LA, we've been hanging out and I've been enjoying it. <gasps> oh, boy! <laughs> Perfect. I'm not engaged right now. Um, TBD, what happens? You know, I feel like you never know what's going to happen, but right now I'm single. You know, obviously, Micah and I still talk and we have a great, you know, relationship. Um, but yeah, TBD, what happens with, with that? I don't want to spill too much. <laughs> I've never had a listing over 10 million. How many houses can say they have two pools? In real estate specifically, um, uh, I think it's really important to, you know, be a go-getter. I, you know, it's important to know what you're talking about. So, you know, knowledge of whatever field you're in, know what you're talking about. But at the end of the day, I think a huge piece is being a good person. and. You know, it's always been super important to me to, I mean, I have a huge heart. My friends and family, like I would do anything for them. I go above and beyond for them. And I do feel like what you put out into the universe, you do get back. Um, and I feel like that's played such a big role in, in my success. So I would be, you know, there's certain, you know, ingredients that play a big role. And I would have to say like, that's almost like the secret ingredient that people don't realize. You know, when you, when you do things for others, and you don't expect anything in return, you know, I do feel like that comes back, you know, it's so many different things. I've been involved in real estate for about five years. As soon as I got my license, I was with Jason. I was just a little bit more part-time because I started my own vegan food company, Emily & Co. I'm in stores across the United States and the company couldn't be going any better. I mean, from a really young age, I just, I loved working, you know, from modeling to babysitting to working at ice cream shop. Specifically though, like I remember first, the very first summer that I worked at this ice cream shop and, and I saved all of the cash and I hid it in my little drawer. And at the end of the summer, I put them all in piles for my mom, my dad, my Nana, my Papa, and my brother. And I like spoiled them for Christmas and it made me so happy. I'm definitely a giver, so. I just remember like that's what drives me is like being able to give back to my family and I've just always kind of had that in me, um, you know, from a really young age and obviously I started investing at 14, uh, self-taught. I was nannying for a family and the father went to Harvard, super, super successful and I remember putting the kids down for a nap and instead of watching TV like most babysitters would do, I remember I was sitting at the computer and I saw the, whatever his Christmas bonus was, and there was a lot of zeros, I'll just tell you that. And I was like, I need, I want this. I want this and I'm gonna figure out a way to do it. You know, I started looking into the stocks that he did. And then of course, once you start reading, you, you kind of pick up the tips of, of things that are soon to be big. And I started investing in healthcare. I'm 14 years old, investing in healthcare. But, you know, I think the earlier that you start, you know, the better chance you have of obviously, you know, being where you want to be at 25, at 30, at whatever age you are, you know? A lot of people say, oh, you wait, you can't do real estate and you can't have a company and you can't invest, but it's like, actually you can do anything that you put your mind to and you can do absolutely anything in the entire world. And even if there's a bump in the road, because of course there's gonna be bumps in the road, it's just leading you to, you know, another path that's probably a better journey. And I would just take it as a little redirection in the GPS. <laughs> Big thanks to Emma for chatting with us. You can find Selling Sunset, of course, on Netflix. Still to come, a breakdown of the show, A Very British Scandal. That's coming up. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next. 
who've made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon. And by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. And welcome back to Popstar Plus, a very British scandal. It's a three-episode miniseries. It's based on the dramatic real-life divorce between two British aristocrats. It stars Paul Bettany, who you've probably seen in the Marvel Universe, and of course Claire Foy, who you know from The Crown. Well, they spoke to us about the turbulent 20th century relationship that captivated the world. It's about a very famous British scandal that I had no idea about, and I think what makes it different uh, from American scandals, which are uh, marvelous on their own, but uh, ours is sort of steeped in the class system, and um, Margaret's father was an industrialist, and, and they sort of bought into the aristocracy. There's been lots of books written about her. She wrote one as well, um, which is basically about how to throw a good dinner party. Um, which no one really wants to know about because everyone wants to know about kind of the salacious elements of, the, of their divorce, especially. But what I found out was that a lot of the books that are written about her are written by men and there's quite a lot of judgment about her and her sexuality and who she was. Um, and so a lot of it was based on the research, but also was kind of the facts about her really, which was that she was very entitled and privileged and she had come from a background where basically she got whatever she wanted from the men in her life and then she sort of married a man who refused to give her anything <laughs> um and so basically then the relationship and the kind of the drama of it that is fictionalized takes over really yeah because a lot of it is basically viewed her viewed from the outside and the judgment of other people about who she was and the terrible things that she did which weren't that terrible really so why are you being i had such a lovely day and we've got to it I'm going to sleep at the club. And tomorrow morning, we go back to Inverara, first train. I won't be. You'll do what I tell you to do and when I tell you to do it. You must be confusing me with one of your other wives. I think it was the first case kind of of its kind in the UK, definitely, because in that sort of divorce proceedings, they were always very private. Um, and there were never really women, women of means who could bring a divorce case against their husband or it was normally the husbands who were divorcing the wives and uh, they were pretty kind of open and shut cases really. But because Margaret had the means to basically take it to the bitter end, she was never gonna give up. It really played out in the media. And so they used the press, but I think that she she was an it girl. So she sort of grew up being lauded and kind of appreciated by the press. And in that way, completely took for granted the fact that they suddenly turned on her and went for her. And the narrative that she had created in her, in her mind of who she was and in the press was so quickly turned and she became kind of, it was a, basically a witch hunt really for her and everything about her because people loved it. They loved the salaciousness of it and the idea that she was such a sexually promiscuous woman and how dare she divorce her husband and who does she think she is. And I think unfortunately, that's kind of one of the things that I felt when I was shooting it, I sort of, thought that I would be shooting it and kind of looking back and going, oh, how terrible it was this woman was treated this way. And I realized that basically nothing's really changed. No, I've been a huge fan of Claire's. I think she's an amazing actress. And so that was the first thing. And then I heard there was a project with her and I read it. And for me, 
it, it seemed like nice counter programming, frankly, because I've been playing a lot of um, nice, warm, fuzzy ro robots, I suppose. <laughs> uh, and uh, to, to play a sort of... Um, uh, close to yourself. Something yeah. closer to myself. <laughs> exactly. It's a bit yeah, it's a cold sociopath. <laughs> uh, just seemed like I was a shoe in So, uh, yeah, so that's... It, for, for me, I was excited at the idea of doing something very different and uh, to work with Claire. It was a real a real joy working with her. She's an amazing scene partner and um, has similar instinct that I have, which is to try and bat away from what the dialogue is 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 doing. And so it was it was it was kind of surprising. I thought it was great. Working with you. It was it felt like you had a real. Yeah, we'd always talk about it, wouldn't we? We'd have like a real, it, that you had a friend on set, like it felt like you had someone who had your back, which is good, but sometimes it doesn't feel like that. Um, it was so much fun, too much fun sometimes. We should mention a very British scandal can be found on Prime Video. Coming up next, we're going to revisit the beloved film, The Sandlot. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? There's a Supreme Court nominee. What would it take for you to vote to confirm her? So I guess the question is, can this end with sanctions alone? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Ali Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. And we're back with a movie that made You're Killing Me Smalls famous. 1993, the classic, The Sandlot. Nearly 30 years later, it still captures the hearts of viewers. We spoke to Patrick Renna, who delivered many of the film's most memorable lines. He played Ham Porter. He was just 14 years old, and he told us about the movie's resonance today. Hey, do you want some more? You're killing me, Smalls. You're killing me, Smalls. You know, my favorite scenes from the movie have to be the, the s'more scene and uh, you're killing me, Smalls, because that's sort of become people's, uh, you know, sort of favorite line of mine. So it, just because of how much it means to other people and making s'mores and things like that, it sort of becomes mine. You stick it on the chocolate. The place on then fire, Ham. you cover it with the other end. Hey, here, make me one of those. Yeah, me too. Then you scuffle. I, I think the, the most fun I had filming was there were two scenes and they're back to back in the movie, but they weren't back to back when we filmed them, which was the, the scene where uh, Phillips, the bad guy, comes with his you know crony team to the, the sand lot and we have our sort of back and forth um, yelling match. Am I good enough to lick the dirt off our cleats? Watch it, jerk. Shut up, idiot! Moron! Scab eater! Butt sniffer! Yeah. Puss licker! Fart smeller! And then it cuts to me behind the batter's box and I'm yelling all the insults at him. Hey, is that your sister out there in left field? Naked? She's 
snake. Shut up, Porter! Those are my favorite scenes. I originally, the insult scene on the Sandlot was written for Benny, but uh, the director on the day said he wanted me to do it because I think Benny was becoming the hero and, you know, he didn't want his hero to trash talk, but he said, you know who could do it? Ham. And then uh, the next day was just, it was a lot of improv with me and the director. He had a bullhorn and he was just yelling insults at me to say to the guys, you know, like, is that your sister out there in left field, you know, uh, or, you know, whatever the insults were. And I would kind of chuckle and then I would read them back and it was a lot of fun. Just a little bit farther. The filming of the ball, getting the ball back from the beast was great because every new scene that we filmed was the next level of like, you know, uh, craftsmanship or science you know it started with a broomstick and then went to an erector set opening and then went to a va uh, vacuum suction you know apparatus or contraption issue retrieval section number one now <laughs> And it was really cool to see what the props department did to sort of, you know, make some new way of getting it. And we just had a lot of fun with that. God, he looks like a dead fish. What? 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 This magic moment. <laughs> so Little good. pervert! Uh, what I remember of the pool scene with Wendy Peppercorn is Wendy Peppercorn. I mean, how do you forget? I also, we filmed that movie in Utah, and it was 100 degrees for three months every day, 95 to 100 degrees, except one day, and that was the pool scene day. It was about 60 degrees, and you can see us all shivering in the pool in the movie, and Squints, uh, you think he's nervous to go kiss the lifeguard, but he actually is just shivering from absolute uh, chills. Oh, gosh, what I remember about auditioning for The Sandlot, um, you know, that was a long time ago. But uh, I was one of the one of the last, if not the last, characters to be cast. The callback was just to go meet the guys the next day, and, you know, the director said, you don't have the job, you have to get along with everyone. So, so I went, I was bigger than all of them, and I just forced them to get along with me, and it was great. You know, some of my favorite memories are actually recent, in, you know, getting to see them again in the last couple of years, it sort of was like our junior high school reunion because I hadn't seen a lot of them in 25 years. You know, one of them was Tom Guyrie who played Smalls, so it was kind of fun to see him 25 years later. And I think on the set, my favorite memories were just, you know, the the group scenes and like those the treehouse scene was a lot of fun because you know that treehouse was built from the from scratch and it was a fake tree even so. It was just kind of created for us, and then the director would have us go in there, and we almost had our own sleepover campfire night, and you know we had the candles for the s'mores, and we were making them, and we were—I mean, we had to do about a hundred takes because that s'more scene, we were just making each other laugh, all of us, and everyone was ruining takes, and because we were just—it was like boys around a campfire. Who is the most and least like their character? First of all, I would say. At least back then, when we filmed, the most like their character probably was me. I was sort of the loud mouth little punk, uh, or big punk. Hey girls. but also the defender of the Sandlot and that sort of thing. I would say the least like their character, well, the least like their character now is Marty York who played Yeah Yeah. I don't know if you've seen recent pictures of him, but he's about 210 pounds of pure muscle. And back then he was a little shrimp. Uh, probably back then the least like their character was, was Squints. Shauncey Leopardi played a, at least when he was kissing the lifeguard, he played a nervous, insecure little boy, and he was anything but. He was uh, definitely the coolest of all of us filming that movie. I personally like Lone Outside just like I like it. Stupid Lone Outside! Just like I like it! The Great Bambino, yes. 
I'm the Grim Grim Widow! What? I'm the Grim Grim Widow! I don't think any of us imagined that the movie would, would turn into what it has. You know, I think we knew that it wasn't terrible, because you kind of get a sense when you're making a movie if it's good or not, and we knew that it was good, but I don't think there's any way to know that it would mean this much to so many people as it does now. Well, first of all, I think the movie resonates with kids because of baseball, and that is America's pastime. Also, because we got out there and we were playing and we were out in the wilderness and or, or a sand lot and we were, you know, getting dirty and like Karen Allen has the great line, like, go out, have fun, get dirty. I want you to get out into the fresh air and make some friends. I don't think there's enough of that right now and there's too much of this, you know? So families like the movie because it, it it's about spending time together and friendship and brotherhood and inclusion and it sort of reminds everyone what all of this is really about, which is spending time with each other and not just swiping. I mean, swiping's okay once in a while, but you know. Hard to believe this month marks 29 years of the Sandlot. That's unbelievable. Next up, another blast from the past, the one and only Shirley MacLaine. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? Stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. The delightful and talented Shirley MacLaine turns, if you can believe it, 88 this week. And in her honor, from the vault, here she is speaking about her beloved film, Steel Magnolias, back in 1989. The new movie, Steel Magnolias, has to be the most staggering collection of female Hollywood star power since the movie Little Women. Starring Sally Field, Daryl Hannah, Olympia Dukakis, Dolly Parton, and I say her name last only because Julia, she is Julia, with me today. Julia Roberts. And we'll get, to, well, you just said Julia Roberts. And who said Julia Roberts? But Shirley uh. McLean. You're, you're, you're a very generous performer for having made sure that I did not leave out no, any of the Hollywood names. she's remarkable in the movie, too. And all of you, all of those women, came to live in the little real-life town of Natchitoches, Louisiana, to make this movie. And you lived there for three months, whatever did you do to this town? Oh, I think it changed considerably. I spent a lot of time at the yogurt store. Oh, yeah. I spent a lot of time at the VCR store, and I got to know um, the girls who were off from college working in both of those places. I used to take my car and cruise up and down Main Street, which was about as long as this studio, and they had a traffic jam. They all, they do these wonderful southern things, like they sit They in the have a traffic jam, even, yeah. even though they only, Well, because no. they're all out there on Friday and Saturday nights with their daiquiris in their hands, cruising, watching each other. They don't do anything, and they can't pick up anybody because they can't get out of the car. Well, but if you're in town, they can't be watching each other anymore. They had to have been watching you. And that's what they did during the week, but during the weekends, they were watching each other. And then you could get out and watch them. Yeah. It was just wonderful. You know, I'm from the South, so that whole sense of going back into a small town intimacy, I just absolutely loved it. You play a character 
Weezer, who is a local eccentric. Was she based on a real person? Or she was based on a on a couple of people that Bobby knew, Harling, the writer. And uh, but what was interesting was there was kind of a predominant of one woman, and the people in the town all had the predominant one woman to be someone different. You, um, needless to say, are the comedy in this movie, and it's a very funny movie, when you're not crying your eyes out mm. because it's a, a real tearjerker. Yesterday, when Sally Field was here, we didn't address head-on, I followed her lead, the fact that there is a death in the family. You did terms of endearment. So you and I have kind of discussed whether or not one does reveal that to an audience that, 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 that there is something is going to happen, or one does not. What, what do you think? You know, it's not about whether the death will occur because, in my opinion, it's telegraphed very early that it will. What you're interested in is how these women band together out of a solidarity and a kind of real love and warmth and connection with each other when it happens to her daughter. So the piece becomes a slice of Southern life, really. How, And it's about female sensibility. It's about how women always left to their own devices will do the right thing. And a big happy early birthday to you, Shirley MacLaine. All right, you just got a nice dose of Popstar Plus. Join us right back here tomorrow. Be well, everybody. We'll see you soon. watching Today and 30 all day on Today All Day. You know what I mean. Our favorite digital show. It's on your favorite streaming channel. I wonder if they had a good weekend. Well, listen, here it is. It's Monday. Yeah. Here's what's coming your way on the show this morning. We'll start with that secret trip to Kiev overnight. The secretaries of state and defense traveling there to meet with President Zelensky. We will have complete coverage on the messages they delivered face to face to Ukraine's president. Also ahead with online shopping rising at a record pace. Returns are also up in a big way. It's creating a ton of waste. Vicki Wynn found a company doing high tech to deal with it, and it could save you some money as well. Plus, our third hour crew introduces us to a woman with a lot of grit traveling on foot to the tops of mountains and the bottom of the world, Antarctica. She's got amazing stories from her adventures, and she's ready to share them. And Savannah, I got a visit from two of our favorite friends from Home Edit. Aww. Yeah, they had a tough assignment. My, uh, on my office, you know what it looks oh, like. Oh, I do. A landfill. A big dump, yeah. yeah. Like a big old trash dump. can with a door. Don't, don't yeah. say dump. Mm -hmm. Okay, but anyway, they fixed it. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait to see the results. Let's get started. It's time for... Today at 30. We'll start with NBC's Aaron McLaughlin, who is in Ukraine's capital city for us. Hi, Aaron. Good morning. Good morning, Savannah. Here in Kyiv, the U.S. Embassy is sealed off as it has been since the beginning of this war. But that's all about to change. On Sunday, the U.S. Secretaries of State and Defense visited the Ukrainian capital with promises of more military aid and diplomacy they say is necessary for Ukraine to win this war. For the first time since the beginning of this 60-day war, top U.S. officials visited the Ukrainian capital. President Zelensky greeting the U.S. secretaries of state and defense in a visit shrouded in secrecy. What a pleasure it is to see you in person. Promising an additional $700 million in foreign military aid. Secretary Austin says the goal is to make sure Russia suffers significant military losses. We want to see Russia. Uh... Uh, weakened uh, to the degree that it can't uh, do the kinds of things that uh, it has done uh, in, in invading Ukraine. Blinken also announcing the nomination of a new U.S. ambassador, Bridget Brink, and the return of U.S. diplomats to Ukraine. This morning, President Zelensky thanking the United States for the support. At a press conference before the visit held at one of the capital subway stations, doubling as a presidential bomb shelter, I asked President Zelensky about his message to the U.S. secretaries. Why is it important for high-ranking U.S. officials to visit the Ukrainian capital? And what do you plan to tell them? Uh, we are expecting specific things and specific weapons, he says. 
This while on Orthodox Easter weekend, fighting raged on across the Donbass region. Inside the besieged port city of Mariupol, despite calls for a truce and hundreds of civilians trapped, Ukrainian officials say the Russians stormed and bombarded the old steel plant, the last Ukrainian stronghold. And this morning, fires are burning at two oil-related sites in the Russian city of Bryansk, close to the Ukrainian border. And yet in the capital, at the Good Bakery, faced with darkness and despair, the smell of fresh baked bread and compassion, bringing smiles to people's faces. Carefully packing the loaves into boxes to bring Easter cheer to the capital's war-torn suburbs. Our bread is hope and we work with hope. Ukraine on this Orthodox Easter, with death and destruction everywhere, there is also hope and the indomitable spirit of the Ukrainian people. Secretary Blinken says the United States will restore its diplomatic presence inside Ukraine this week with the aim of returning to this embassy as soon as possible. Savannah. All right, Aaron, thank you. We're joined now by NBC News national security analyst Jeremy Bash, former chief of staff at the CIA and the Pentagon. Jeremy, we'll get to the nitty gritty of some of the deliverables in a moment. But first, what does it signal to have two high ranking American officials come to Kiev in the middle of this war? And, and frankly, should it have been President Biden? Well, Savannah, this visit by Secretary Austin and Secretary Blinken are not only symbols of American diplomatic and military power standing four square behind Ukraine, but also, as you noted, they came with specifics. They came with tangible new announcements about weapons and about uh, opening of our embassy in Kiev. Should have been President Biden. Look, he travels with a much larger security entourage, would have been much harder to keep secret. We did that in Iraq and Afghanistan, but then again, our troops who were on the ground there, we controlled the skies. But Defense Secretary Austin, in a briefing afterward, made some striking remarks about what the U.S. was hoping in terms of Russia, wanting Russia to be weakened and unable to rebuild its military. Were you struck by that? Is that a significantly more aggressive posture than you would have expected the Defense Secretary to, frankly, say out loud? Well, actually, Savannah, I was glad he said it because I think it's clearly that's our policy. That's our policy in the West. We can't allow a Russia to do this again to Ukraine. If we just push them back to the status quo ante, they could continue to have a military capability that could uh, that could hold Ukraine under threat. And I don't think we in the West should allow that. In his readout of the meeting, President Zelensky mentioned further sanctions, really made that a, a point of stressing something we didn't hear a lot from the American officials about tougher sanctions. Is that a point of dis? Connect between the two countries right now? No, not at all. In fact, the U.S. is rolling out new sanctions all the time. I think the key, Savannah, is, of course, when we roll out sanctions, we have to do so in concert with our NATO allies. If we do it alone, it's not going to be worth much. So we have to do it totally in concert with Europe. And, of course, we're working on that all the time. All right. Jeremy Bash, thanks for your time. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Savannah. All right, hold on, let's get a morning boost for okay. Monday. Monday I boost. actually saw this one, and it kind of took my breath away. If you're a sports fan, you're going to love this. A young player was having a rough time at rugby camp in England. His confidence was so badly shaken, the kid was in tears. And then this is what happened. A teammate gave him an incredible pep talk. Take a look. Okay. Everyone's older than me. Everyone's you, don't, you don't have to tackle. Bob, listen to me. No, Bob, listen to me. Trust me. Look at me. Look at me, Bob. I'm the shortest kid here. Listen, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're short, you're young. It doesn't matter if you're tall or it. It doesn't matter if you're fat. It doesn't matter if you're tall. Bro, you are a brilliant rugby player. You understand that? You're insane. You are actually insane for your age. You're insane. Come on, give me a hug. That's so mad. That's so good. That oh, come, on. Coaching. come on. Come on. The coach can be heard saying best teammate ever as the boys headed back to the game. Can you be coaching? Wait. Okay. That's that let's incredible. take the Yankee story. Let's move it aside yes. Yes. and let's put that rugby story back Actually, instead. let's send that little yes. boy to Yankee Stadium <laughs> yeah. and have him but give that, a little talk on that, sportsmanship. Is that amazing? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. So moving. Beautiful. All right. Thank you, Hoda. We needed <laughs> that. We needed it. We needed it. We needed it. New. Yeah. Yes. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. 
rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Now, with today's consumer these days, thanks to the internet, shopping is easier than ever. But that explosion in online shopping has also led to a rise in returns. And those items don't always go back to the store like you might think. Senior consumer investigative correspondent Vicki Wynn is here with a mm -hmm. behind the scenes look at how millions of products are being revamped and resold oh. after you returned them. <laughs> all right, Vic, good exactly. morning. All the re's. Good morning to you. Good morning to you at home. The convenience of online shopping and now online returns does come at a major cost to the environment. Not only are we packing and shipping more items back and forth, we're also seeing millions of items ending up in landfills even when they could be resold. Well, that is all changing. Take a look at how you can shop smarter, reduce waste, and save money. Point, click, buy. E-commerce reached an all-time high in 2021, an estimated $469 billion in sales, but shoppers return more than 20% of those purchases. And it's easy to see why. The packages come right to your door. If you don't like it, it doesn't fit, no problem. Most retailers will let you repackage the item and ship it back to them for a full refund. While you might expect the returns to go back on store shelves, they often end up here, the dump. By one estimate, 25% of returned items go to a landfill, leading to 9.6 billion pounds of waste last year. As they say, one person's trash is another person's treasure. And that is certainly the case here at Liquidity Services. Here at this massive warehouse, they specialize in giving a second life to millions of products that have been returned. The high-tech facility near Dallas is one of seven across North America that refurbish up to 10 million return products every month. Some have been used, others are brand new or simply in damaged packaging. Liquidity Services is one of the largest companies in a growing industry called reverse logistics. Garbage is a dirty word here. That's throwing money away. So we're going to resell everything we can. My tour guide, Vice President Jeff Rexigol, says they salvage more than 99% of the products they receive. This TV looks totally smashed up, like it should go to the landfill, but you're saying no? This is a great example of trash to treasure. So this does have a, a broken screen, yeah. as we can see here. Uh -huh. But next to it, we have the same model of TV that has an audio problem. So we have two TVs that have an issue. What we're going to do is we're going to take these two and create one great TV by taking the screen off and putting it on this one. Throughout the day, workers unload tractor trailers full of returned items, furniture, clothing, camping gear, exercise equipment, anything. Sometimes we don't even know what's in it. And so we'll receive a pallet. We'll go through and identify each item. So it's a surprise box. It is. Christmas morning every day. That's right. Can we open this? Let's go. I feel like I'm opening a present. Oh, clothes just like what I'd find under my tree. Then the products are inspected and categorized. Some end up in this giant warehouse waiting to be resold at a fraction of the retail price. What does that mean for me as a consumer? Do I get it for a discount? Consumers can get great deals on refurbished merchandise up to 50 or 60% off. Electronics are some of the most harmful discarded materials because they can release heavy metals and toxins that pollute our air, soil and water. Here they help keep electronics in use. It all happens in this electronics triage room where the products come rolling in on this conveyor belt and they're cleaned, they're tested, they're repaired, whatever's needed to get them ready for resale. Even the cardboard and styrofoam packaging get recycled again and again. Two containers of this turns into one block of this, wow. which will get turned back into that. But we're helping the environment. We're keeping those products out of landfills and using them to create great deals for consumers. And you can do your part too. 
The best thing to do if you're thinking about returning the item is to try to keep it in its original packaging because the moment it no longer looks brand new, the chances of it ending up in a landfill go up significantly. And if it's clothing, of course, always keep the tags on and never wear the items outside or get them dirty. And take a moment to think before you click buy. Ask, do I need this and will I keep it? That pause can help you save money and protect the planet. Now, if you do end up with something you don't want to keep and you can't afford not to return it, consider giving that item to a friend who would use it, yeah. or you can donate mm -hmm. it. That all cuts down on the carbon cost of those trucks and planes going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And Vicki, this has never happened to me, but sometimes <laughs> retailers actually let you keep the item. Oh, really? yes. Occasionally <laughs> they do, and that is because it's sometimes cheaper to give you that refund and still let you keep the item. It often happens for inexpensive uh, or really bulky products uh -huh. because it costs more to restock that item than the value of the item. But if you are thinking about trying to take advantage of that perk. Believe me, retailers do keep an eye on it. <laughs> yeah, and they'll cut off no returners. Yeah. 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 returners yeah. Not, not you. Your number. Yeah. That was great, Vic. Thank that you. Was you. Really that was really good. Good. I have a feeling Craig and I will be sending links of those <laughs> to story to somebody we know. Oh, oh really? Maybe, Maybe our wives. The oh. <laughs> to cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. We are back with a woman whose grit has taken her to some incredible places, from the top of a mountain to the bottom of the globe in Antarctica. Antarctica. And she's traveling on foot and coming away with some amazing stories. I was amazed that I, my feet were taking me to places that I could, could not see otherwise. Author Amy McCulloch is turning the page one step at a time. A YA novelist known for her book series like Jinxed, Amy is reaching new heights and it all started with walking, something she picked up during a difficult time in her life. I was going through a divorce after um, only being married for a year. I was really suffering and didn't know what to do with myself at all. And so it came from this desire to just put myself in the way of beauty. After completing a walking trail in Ireland, she set her sights on a new peak. And in 2019, Amy, who was born in the UK but grew up in Canada, became the youngest Canadian woman to summit Mount Manaslu in Nepal, the world's eighth highest peak. She is one of only six Canadian women to do so. I would go into these outdoor shops and was met with so much skepticism and questions. You know, you already feel a bit like an imposter when you're heading out to these mountains. But you have as much right as, you know, any of the, the men on the mountain to go. 
It was Amy's experiences on Mount Manaslu's death zone that inspired her latest novel, Breathless. Her adult fiction debut, a high altitude thriller about a young journalist and novice climber who was invited to scale a mountain in exchange for a career making interview. The fact that the environment itself was dangerous, plus the fact that you are on the mountain with strangers. I just thought if one of those people who I'm here with had nefarious intentions, you know, you could get away with it so easily. And I just thought that was the, the kind of perfect uh, setting for a thriller. After taking time to catch her breath, Amy took on her next challenge, completing the Marathon du Sable earlier this month, a 156 mile ultra marathon in the Sahara Desert, known as the toughest foot race on earth. I finished each leg completely exhausted. Uh, and on the second day, we had an incredible seven hour sandstorm, which just blasted us with 100 kilometer an hour winds sometimes, gusts, yeah sand in the face and I was actually orienteering my route with a compass because I couldn't see more than you know five feet in front of me. So why put herself through such difficult physical and emotional conditions? To kind of go into this most remote place on earth and see the night sky unfold in front of you just as resplendent with stars or to go up into the high altitude world and just see a blue sky so blue it's just ultramarine. Although it's a huge, huge risk for me to get that experience and to see those things, it suddenly became worth the risk in the balance. Her advice for folks looking to get into mountaineering or ultra marathoning? In my deepest, darkest moments on the Saharan Marathon, all I was thinking was one more step. Just do one more step. It might take you hours, as it did for me in the marathon, to finish, but I wasn't racing for first. All I was trying to do was get to the end, one foot in front of the other. Amy is already looking forward to her next novel, another thriller based on her experience in an extreme environment, this time set in Antarctica. I don't know where I'm going to have to take myself next in the name of research. So far, I've been up to the top of an 8,000 meter peak. I've run 250 kilometers through the Sahara Desert. I've been to the bottom of the world in Antarctica. I'm not quite sure where I'm going to have to go next, um, but I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what that next opportunity is going to be for me. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking awesome. forward too. Right? So here's the takeaway. Not, you don't have to climb a mountain, no. right? Or go hiking in a desert somewhere. But if you have an idea, you have a passion, yeah. it's not a bad idea to just go for it. And try go, it. That's Amy. what this series is all about. I was about to say, I feel like a bum. <laughs> Amy's new book, by the way, Breathless, is available for pre-order and it comes out on May 3rd. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It's time to spring forward with a little seasonal clean out. It feels so good to be organized. It does. That was actually a beautiful day. And on that very day, I just want to point out before we get to this, that Clea, who is one of the beautiful home edit ladies, told me that she was battling breast cancer going in for surgery. We have great news. She is home. She is recovering. She says she is strong. So we just want to say go, Clea. And I know this. Send our love to yes, her. Yes, indeed. I know this is one of the last things that she did before she went into surgery. Mm -hmm. They came. They organized. They 
one point they organized my home, yes. and now look at that. That's what they did in my house. I wish your closet it still looked like no, that. It no, it doesn't. it doesn't. It looks like it always did. Well, we spend a lot of time here at work, and to say that your office was in need of some help <laughs> was really an understatement. So we called up Clea and Joanna and asked them if they could come back to your office, do a little makeover. Take a look. I'm Clea. And I'm Joanna. We are actually professional organizers. Crazy people. Same thing. America jumped on the bandwagon, getting organized with Clea Shearer and Joanna Teplin, the home edit girls. With nearly six million followers on social media and those celeb clients like Reese, Neil, and Chloe. Clea and Joanna showcased their signature rainbow organization on their hit Netflix show called Get Organized with the Home Edit. Okay, so I'm in Hoda's office. I'm sitting where all the magic happens. I see a lot of scrunchies. For some reason, there's toilet paper roll. It's a little confusing. There's stuff everywhere. What's happening here? She has one, two, three, four, five, six. Don't think it's it. Seven candles right here. And I knew just who could assist. Where are the home edit ladies? Help, help, help. This might be your biggest project yet. By the way, I can see 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, okay. 15, 16. She has candles everywhere. Okay. Hoda is a bit of a collector. That's a nice way to put it. What do you have in mind for Hoda's office? Okay, well, I just, I know that Hoda wants less. Mm -hmm. So I think she needs kind of organized place. I think paring down, making it consistent will look very streamlined in here. And I think because she's such a creative, I think she needs more blank surfaces. There's papers, there's face yeah. wipes. There's a lot of makeup. Oh, oh peanut, peanut butter. butter. Peanut butter. We definitely are going to have a job sticky. cut out for us. It's a little sticky. <laughs> it's a little sticky. I was going to ask about these guys. Well, <laughs> All right. she loves Blake. I know. She okay. loves Drew. OK, I mean, could they guard her office from the outside? I do notice that there's a lot of things around here. There's Kathy Lee, <laughs> but where's the photo of me? <laughs> I live in my girl's heart. Well, I wish you luck. We'll See, sure more you candles. candles, candle, 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 candle. candle. <laughs> She's a thousand candles. All right, let's do our thing. With the office edit underway. All books yeah. and office books. supplies can come over here. Put them on the couch for now. Do you think we're like reusing this? Let's get them out. Get them out of here. It was time to find a new place for Hoda's cardboard office mates. Mary, we're going to give you some assistance. And in addition to organizing all that wine. Can I just like start passing y'all wine? And all those candles. So these are all her to keep. Whatever fit in the bin is staying. We needed to make a decor plan. I think she could use a new rug, yeah. some new pillows, pops of color. Yeah. She zooms from this office, so I'd love to make her a zoom background that is a little bit more fitting for on camera. The key to the bookshelf. You want to make sure wherever Hoda is going to be that you can see a full representation of all the different colors, so it's not just like pink and red right behind her head. We really wanted to kind of showcase the spectrum. And then all of the decorative objects, you just want to associate them with the color of the book. With pops of color in place, we're ready. Welcome to your new office. Can I open, open your eyes? <laughs> oh my god! Welcome. Oh my god, I kind of feel like... your new office. Can you believe it? Oh my god, I kind of feel like I'm getting misty. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have chills? <gasps> Holy! Holy! Everything is in the right place. Holy! We did add a picture or two. Because <laughs> there was a lot of evidence of Kathy Lee, but not much of me. Oh my god, Drew, my yes, Drew corner. You're a Drew corner. Oh my god. And, and here's my... your new fridge. Your Ooh. snack area. Oh, apples, oranges. Produce. Oh my god, all Carrots the things I love. So you don't have to dip your finger into the hummus. <laughs> <laughs> I've used a paper clip. We got you a new rug. I love every And look, they gave you a really pretty, because we were tired of looking at that same pillow, a <laughs> zoom background. Oh my god, all the books are color coordinated? You put a new dress on the Barbie? Look, they oh, put a new dress Hoda, on the Barbie. Hoda. Whose clothes are these? They're yours. You can just find them now. <laughs> Wait a minute. Who did this? It wasn't all me. It actually wasn't me really at all. <laughs> it was the home edit girl! Yes! Can you believe yes! it? I am shocked. I feel like 
clear yes. in here now. What was the gross thing <laughs> you found? I'm kind of embarrassed oh. you well, over it. Could, could y'all do it without <laughs> a hazmat? It was a peanut butter egg. And, and a toilet paper roll. And it was toilet paper and peanut butter. Okay, so okay. I have a zone. Okay. They're actually, welcome to your candle station. Actually, we have two stations for candles. One Wait, is, oh. yes, these are your candles to burn. Then we have a gifting candle station. Oh my God, my dental yes. area. Yes. Instead of toilet paper, we've got Jamex. And look oh at how many God. awards you've won. Oh They're all in one place. Who even knew? I know. Yeah, wow. They, 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 were, they were on the ground. <laughs> they were. We had to reinforce the shelves because of the weight of your accomplishment. Yeah. I can't tell you how incredibly surprised I am at what y'all did. This is yeah. amazing. Office. I love it, y'all. I love it. I love it. I love it. Beautiful. By the way, I'm never going to leave my office. I know. <laughs> That was amazing, Jenna. And when I say never, I just told you that if I had two cots, I'd move my kids in there and we'd live. Because it's the coolest, most beautiful space. I, it's so airy and oh lovely. And they just like they have a snack area and they have everything. And just so you know, oh my God, the before and after is shocking. The before and after the before is before and after is horrifying. I like how they call you a collector. I felt like that was a really know, kind thing I don't way think, to say. In it. my defense, I'm not a hoarder, I'm just lazy. I just don't get rid of it. It's, it's like true. I'm not like I need more, but it just keeps coming. And again, that whole segment was shot, I, and I didn't really know anything was going on with Clea afterwards. Yes. And I was just lingering around. She wasn't even going to tell me, and she just said, as you know, as we were all leaving after we said goodbye, I just want to let you know something. I'm battling breast cancer, and I'm having surgery. So again, if you missed the beginning, yeah, Clea is home. She's improving. She feels good. Also, what a bright light that she oh, came here God. to I help you in the she, midst of all of her, what it, she has going on. It just on. shows you. They, they're, they're incredible. They really um, are. We love you, Clea. We love you, we Joanna. Love you we all come do all of our rooms. Well, she actually, her her dressing room. The snacks were crazy. Your and dressing room needs help. I know. But, okay. Anyway, that's okay. okay. One we can't do everything. Tomorrow, right. guess what? It's it's Jenna's turn. Yep. All I right. get to move into a new space. Uh, that's my new office. So it's, it's clean and clear, it's but clean it and needed clear. some love. Yeah, so. it did. So Hoda, you brought in a designer? I did. I did. I brought in a designer. We took care of you, uh, and you'll see when you get there. It's, okay. it's cool. Awesome. All right, before we go, you have another oh. episode of Making Space. This one is And your 10. space is Wait. very clean now and uncluttered. <laughs> this is a 10-plus Oscar winner, Viola Davis. Uh. She has a new book out. You guys, if you're having a crummy day, listen to her. If you're having a great day, listen to her. She's chock full of life, les life lessons, all the things she's overcome in her life. Hope you check it out wherever you get your podcast. Yeah, that's not can't miss. We will see you tomorrow. It'll be Tuesday. Have a good one. New York City is home to so many iconic foods. But when the city that never sleeps wakes up for breakfast, they want a bagel with a cream cheese schmear piled high with locks. There's no other city that makes a bagel like a New York City bagel. I have not had good bagels in any other city. I came out the wound eating bagels. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. If New York's known for anything, it's its bagels. And we got them all. Everything bagels, rainbow bagels, pumpkin bagels, croissant bagels, and of course you can't have them without a schmear. While the bagel first came from Poland, many food historians say its pairing with salmon and cream cheese originated right here in the Big Apple. In this town, few specialty food shops are as beloved and as historic as Russ and Daughters. I've been waiting in line probably 15, 20 minutes, but it's definitely worth it. I like the, the contrast of the flavor. It's like a nice little bagel with a with salty lox. Something about the salmon and cream cheese together. Like I try to make it at home, but it's nothing compared to Russ and Daughters. They've been serving premium smoked fish to hungry New Yorkers and folks from around the world for over 100 years. Just a few blocks from the store is the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Hi, Al. Hey, Hello. how are you? Welcome to the Russell Daughters Cafe. Nice to see it's you. It's great guys. to have you here. Thanks for having us. This is beautiful. Thank you. Nikki Russ Fetterman and Josh Russ Tupper are the grandchildren of the original daughters. These cousins are fourth generation owners carrying on their family's culinary legacy. So, 
This is Russ and Daughters. Wow. This is our great grandfather, Joel Russ, who started the business, his wife, Bella, and his three daughters. Um, we, Josh and I have the same grandmother, and she was the youngest of the three. Was it unusual at that time for you, because you usually would see so and so and sons, yeah. but to see Russ and daughters. Very unusual. But I mean, honestly, if he'd had sons, it probably would have been Russ and sons. Well, thank like, goodness he did. We like exactly. to think of him as a feminist, but he was a good businessman. Joel Russ immigrated from Poland in 1907. And he started just standing on the streets of the Lower East Side selling schmaltz herring out of a barrel. And a family could feed itself for two nights with one fish. In 1914, he opened his first brick and mortar shop, J. Russ National Appetizing. Joel and his wife had three daughters, Patty, Ida, and Anne. When they turned 11, each daughter began working with their dad. What was their relationship like with him? I, because uh, he's your dad, but he's also your boss. your boss. Yeah, and I think he cared more about being the boss and the shopkeeper. He was a new immigrant to this country who was just trying to survive and make a place for his family. And that was his focus. And he saw his children as, as, you know, cheap labor. The sisters grew up learning all aspects of the business. In 1935, Hattie, Ida, and Anne became Joel's partners. The shop was renamed Russ and Daughters, making it the first in America to bear and daughters in its title. When your great-grandfather decided to, to start Russ and Daughters, why the Lower East Side? After Ellis Island, this was the starting off point for the majority of poor Jewish immigrants. This is where they landed and they got their start. And so he was just feeding basic food to other poor immigrants like himself. At the turn of the century, this neighborhood was one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Many immigrants from all around the world lived in overcrowded tenement buildings, the conditions having a profound impact on their diets. One of the things about Lower East Side Jewish food is that a lot of food wasn't made at home. When you don't have running water or when you don't have electric or gas stoves, it's really hard to do very much cooking. And so for, for women who are responsible for feeding their families, they had to get food from push carts, from restaurants, from bakeries. Joel Russ was one of many vendors catering to this new population. I've, I've always been curious, how did it come about, or from what you've heard, that somebody thought, hey, you know, here's this round bread, we'll put some fish on it, but oh, by the way, before we do, let's put some cream cheese, some dairy yeah. on it. Yeah, first of all, Russ and Daughters is the torchbearer of what's called appetizing. And this is a food tradition born here in New York, and it's the sister food tradition to delicatessen, both of which come up through the Jewish kosher dietary rules. You have to separate fish and dairy from meat. So a delicatessen, strictly speaking, is for meat. The appetizing store is where you go for fish and dairy, things like herring, smoked fish, when we say bagel and lox, most people are, you know, we're referring to a smoked salmon, but sure. the original bagel and lox was not with smoked salmon. Technically, lox, or belly lox, is salmon cured in salt, which preserves fish without refrigeration. There's no smoking involved, and it's incredibly salty, so it pairs perfectly with tangy cream cheese. But who was the first person to put lox on a bagel? So no one really knows how bagels, lox, and cream cheese all came together. We know that bagels come from Eastern Europe. We know that lox kind of comes basically from Nova Scotia, kind of. We know that cream cheese is an American food. But what we know is that these things come together as part of a compromise between different generations of American Jews. Jewish law prohibits cooking with most heat sources on the Sabbath. So the combo of bagels and lox created a filling meal for observant Jews to enjoy on the day of rest. It's good for a family, but you or your daughter-in-law didn't have to be spending the, the previous day cooking. As one of the country's oldest appetizing stores, Russ and Daughters has been serving kosher meals for generations. 
and the weekends are still their busiest days. I can't think really of th anything that's more New York than lox and bagels. I agree. I think that this is a food that came up through the Eastern European Jewish immigrants to New York. But now it's it transformed and just become New York food. It belongs to all New Yorkers. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Will mean Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, is this? Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. In the United States, women own less than 20% of all businesses. At the iconic Russ and Daughters, co-owner Nikki Russ Betterman is building on the legacy of her grandmother and great aunts. Growing up, you, you follow in the footsteps of, of strong women who may not have chosen this, but took it on and obviously made it really successful. What is it like for you following in those footsteps? It's a tremendous feeling to be now the and great-granddaughter. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a good customer of ours. Her family came from the Lower East Side. And she once said that before she knew the word feminist, when she looked up at the sign, Russ and Daughter, she understood that women could have an impact. Your family's business, Russ and Daughter, has survived two world wars, a depression, you're here in the shadow of the World Trade Center. Yes. Why has this place been able to not just survive, but thrive? I think because in each generation there has been someone who wanted to do this. This is food that people turn to for comfort in hard times. And during the pandemic, we saw that, you know, people were shipping Russ and Daughters all over the country to their loved ones because they couldn't be together. And so sending, you know, bagels and locks and babka, say, you know, I love you, I miss you. Here, let me feed you. Having a schmear over Zoom. Oh, there was a lot of that. <laughs> okay, so you can get smoked fish pretty much everywhere these days, but not quite like this. The salmon sold at Russ and Daughters is prized for its high fat content, from the milder Gaspe Nova to the smokier Scottish. And this gourmet fish? is all sliced by hand. When you hold it up, I mean, it's it's almost translucent. That. Yeah, I think we should show you how we get at that then. Yeah, me and a sharp utensil, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> it takes up to six months of training to master the slicing technique here. So Al, I hear you have some knife skills. Well, I've been in a fight or two, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, probably nothing like yours. So how, how long have you been slicing salmon? I've been at the store for 20 years. Wow. Um, so I've been slicing for a while. All right. So, so uh, I watch people slice, and I, I, I'm amazed at, at how patient, because it seems like that's part of the, the skill. The reality is, when you know how to slice, mm -hmm. it is one of the most relaxing things you can do. Very zen. Very zen. Ooh. Meditative, right? Mm. The trick is, don't look anywhere on the fish. You have to really feel the fish. Be the fish. 
be the fish, which is a very difficult concept to train oh, someone. That's good. Um, and particularly the first couple slices are, mm. don't be upset okay. if they don't look great. The idea is to make a consistently thick slice. You make so, faces at me? No, I'm just watching you not watch the fish. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Be the fish. Not looking. You should, you should look. I should you look. You got a sharp knife in your hand, Howie. And you can see that as you change the angle of the knife, it changes the thickness. Yeah. Right? So now that's Drastically, a very... Drastically, more than a, you think. That's more than... Oh, my gosh. That's a very thick... We call those chuletas. Chuletas? Yeah. Chops. Ah. In Spanish. I was going to say, that sounded... That, that didn't sound <laughs> Yiddish. Not, not that Yiddish. That did not sound not Yiddish, Yiddish to me. Yeah. Does the way you cut it affect the taste of it or the texture of it? The texture which uh, affects the experience of the salmon. It's almost like you're eating the essence of salmon, not salmon. It's very delicate. It's a very appealing mm -hmm. texture and, and mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thinner. Josh, thanks so much. Nice meeting you. Such a pleasure to have you. Ah, smoke them if you got them. Up next, how fresh salmon gets turned into locks. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon. And by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it what's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? There's a Supreme Court nominee. What would it take for you to vote to confirm her? So I guess the question is, can this end with sanctions alone? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. I'm here at the Acme Smoked Fish Factory. Now there is something fishy going on in there, and you better believe I'm going to find out what it is. The folks at Acme Process Smoke and pack nearly 8 million pounds of fish every year. They sell to eateries all over the country, including Russ and Daughters. It smells of smoke and it smells of fish. That's the way it's supposed to be. It smells right. like New York City. Yes. All right, so as you know, in any food, food plant, food safety is uh -huh. of paramount importance. Right. I see you got your boots on I here. just happen to be wearing these. Awesome. <laughs> I'll walk you through the process of how salmon turns into smoked salmon. Adam Caslow is the fourth generation owner of Acme Smoked Fish. His great grandfather, Harry Brownstein, started selling fish after immigrating from Russia to Brooklyn. Wow. Harry started in the smoked fish business in the early 1900s, in 1906 to be exact. Out of, he went, out of a push cart? Out of a, 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 a horse drawn 
wagon. Wow. He would go around buying fish from different smokehouses throughout Brooklyn and Queens and had himself the sales route. You know, he worked close to 45 years. I mean, his dream was to open up his own smokehouse, and it took him 45 years to finally achieve that. Wow. Adam now runs a massive smoked fish empire, supplying many of New York City's popular bagel shops, from H&H &H to Essa Bagel. Acme also selling to national grocers, like Trader Joe's. At the end of the day, uh -huh. it's all about the fish. We bring in fish from all over the world. Uh -huh. Smoked salmon is probably the most popular thing that we make, and our salmon come from different places, Norway, Scotland, Chile, and Alaska. It can take up to five days to make smoked salmon. Every order is made to the buyer's tastes, from the type of salmon to the curing method. The first step, cutting a whole fish into fillets. Whoa! Yeah, so this is a 12 kilo whole salmon Jeez. that I caught over here in Long Island Sound. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> This is an Atlantic salmon, uh -huh. it's farm, farm raised. We use Atlantic salmon because it has the, the most fat and fat equals flavor when making smoked, smoked salmon. Right, so what are you cutting out the, like the backbone there? Yeah, just do your bone. Uh-huh. Carving into a fish this size requires expert hands. After the fish is filleted, it's preserved with salt. The fish is then treated with a wet brine or a dry cure. Okay. So let's dry, dry cure some, some salmon. Good. First thing, we're gonna get it onto the uh, raft. Okay. okay. So see if you can pick up this salmon, grab it by the, by the, the tail. Okay. Grab with your other hand. Underneath. And we're gonna lay it onto this, the, the screen. Okay. Perfect. Great. Step two, we're gonna grab a handful of salt. So it's just a thin layer. Yep. Right along the top of the dorsal. Like kind of down the center line, I suppose. And we'll give it a nice love, love tap. That's it? That's it. This fish is rather large. So traditionally, we would probably dry, uh, wet brine uh -huh. this, this fish. But for smaller fish, the, the dry cure lasts about 24 hours. Okay, that's a huge fish. Right. After curing, the fillets are cold smoked for up to 20 hours. This process imparts a subtle smoky flavor. Let me show you how the smoker works. So, these are a collection of that wood chip blend that we were uh -huh. talking about earlier. There are different ways to smoke fish fillets. Hot smoking results in flaky, opaque fillets. Unlike traditional lox, smoked salmon is cold smoked below 85 degrees. This helps the fish retain its silky texture and makes it perfect for slicing. Ready to help me get this bad boy into the You oven? bet. All right. All right. Hey now. Let's close her up. Woo! Shut her down. After the smoker, the fish is cooled, then packed for shipping. What would your great grandfather say if he could see all of this? I think he'd be amazed at how difficult it was for him to achieve his dream. Right. Now his descendants have been able to build upon that dream and build us into one of the preeminent smokers in the U.S. Up next, a vegan deli taking on tradition with plant-based lox and cashew cream cheese. Oh, you don't want to miss this. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world, because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Ali Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next. 
who've made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Back on the Lower East Side, two sisters, inspired by their Jewish heritage, are on a mission to make the food they loved growing up in a more sustainable way. Ladies, nice to meet you. Nice to meet Boom. you. Boom, want to show me around? Please, come Play, on in. Lead away. Erica and Sarah Kaberski are the co-owners of Orchard Grocer, an entirely vegan market inspired by classic delicatessens. This is our healthy cashew cream cheese. They want to make the vegan lifestyle easier for all. Right after college, they opened their first business, a shoe store called Moo Shoes. We opened our vegan shoe store 20 years ago. How are they? They're comfortable? About five years ago, we decided that we were going to update it by adding our vegan grocer, basically because it seemed like that's what our customers want. Um, after asking us what our shoes were made of, probably where should I go eat was um, the second most common question. So we decided to create an experience where they could just go eat next door. Growing up in Queens, the sisters' Jewish culture and food were closely linked. They had 10 Jewish delis in their neighborhood alone. Probably every Sunday, it's a tradition in our family, a dozen bagels um, at the bagel store. A dozen always meant 15. I don't know why that was, but and uh, with the cream cheese and lox, and that was just uh, how we spent our Sundays. Both sisters became vegan as teenagers, but felt they lost a piece of their roots by giving up certain foods. I think our parents were supportive of our changes to the vegan lifestyle. We grew up in a very culturally Jewish household, so all of our traditions were just based around food. Today, a lot of folks are going vegan for a variety of reasons, from reported health benefits to concerns over animal welfare. For the sisters, it's also a matter of global importance. We're watching climate change happen right now, and. I think that's causing a lot of people to think twice about what they're eating and how they are contributing. So it makes sense to us that it is becoming so mainstream. In 2017, Sarah and Erica saw not just an opportunity to satisfy a growing market, but to pay homage to their Jewish roots. We wanted to have a, a good sandwich selection that really epitomizes like New York deli food. So obviously a bagel and mox was gonna be there. Orchard Grocer sells a variety of vegan sandwiches, including Reuben's and tuna melts. But the sisters are most passionate about serving up a sense of nostalgia. People are so worried about giving things up. So I think just creating those alternatives and just something that people are familiar with and gives them that feeling of home. Yeah, like we haven't had to give up our Sunday tradition of um, bagels and lox. To help make their unique deli a reality, the sisters hired vegan chef Nora Vargas. Nora shares a passion for plant-based foods. She also knows how to turn carrots into salty locks. How did you come up? I mean, you have to think, okay, what can mimic uh, mm -hmm. a smoked salmon? Yeah. And so how did you, was it look like, like you yeah. thought, well, the only orange vegetable out there <laughs> exactly. other than a sweet potato is carrot. We know the texture that we need to go for. We know the flavor that we want to go for so we started with the color and then we just kind of built it from there okay so let's get started I'm, I'm really it. fascinated okay by all right I'm excited so we have prepared what do we have maybe 10 pounds of carrots here wow. for you these are huge these would have been huge carrots seriously yeah like wow. the size of my forearm but you <laughs> you have you have Slice them very thin on a mandolin? Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. All right, so we're all gloved up and we are going to, the next step in this process is to 
uh, apply our rub okay. to our carrots. So in here we have a mixture of sugar, salt, and the rest I can't tell you about. Oh, uh, it's a secret exactly. kind of thing. So yeah. this this would be kind of like the brine that you would mm -hmm. use, the dry brine that you would use yes. on fish. Exactly. Except yeah. it's going on vegetables. Yeah. We got our inspiration for a lot of different components of this recipe from the way that you would actually prepare fish if we were preparing fish and not carrots. Right. Coat everything. Hmm, interesting. Oh no, don't smell it. Don't, don't figure out the secret just I'm, by smelling I'm, it. Uh, okay, now. Because if I figure it out, she's gonna have to kill me. <laughs> so I'm just gonna start rubbing, just smushing everything in there. Once we get everything coated, we would let this sit for three to six hours, mm -hmm. probably. Okay, great. So I think we've, I think we nailed it. Okay. In here. Is another secret ingredient? Definitely. Jeez, yeah, a, but I can tell you. A lot of secrets here at Orchard. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit. Okay. Okay, so it's a combination of olive oil mm -hmm. and aquafaba. Aquafaba? Yeah, are you familiar with that ingredient? I don't know. You know when you're opening up a can of beans right. and you gotta drain them? Yes. The stuff that you drain out, that's aquafaba. Aquafaba. It's like, it's, Bean water. It's bean bean juice. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna pour, okay. and then you can kind of do the same process. Okay. That we did same before. process. Just squish it all in there. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. After we had let our carrots sit for three to six hours, right. um, we toss them in the oven. So they bake. We like to call it cold smoking just ah. to sound like classy. Like the process of making smoked salmon. Exactly, yeah. That does look very much like smoked salmon. <laughs> and what would a bagel and lox be without the cream cheese? This vegan spread is made with raw cashews, salt, some secret spices, and coconut oil, all blended together with soft tofu. Should we make a bagel? Sure, let's do it. Cheers. This is a really terrific idea. Thank I'm, you. Thank you for opening my eyes. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That yeah. was fantastic. Okay, a great way to finish things up. I mean, we've, we've seen the history, we've gone to the past, we were in the present, and you have brought us the locks and bagels of the future! <laughs> A bagel with cream cheese and smoked salmon is a uniquely American combination. Born from Jewish roots, transformed by local ingredients, and carried on by new generations, this breakfast tradition has truly stood the test of time when it comes to food in New York City. Breaking news on a mission. The secretaries of state and defense make a secret trip to Kyiv for a high stakes face to face with Ukraine's president, delivering military aid, an announcement about the return of U.S. diplomats, and a blunt assessment of Russia's war so far. We've already lost a lot of military.